What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 736. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources, and joining me on the line, all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how did the uh, RC go? Well, it was interesting. So uh, about five minutes before decks were due, <laughs> I, uh, I audibled. So oh, I was going to play... Five minutes? <laughs> Yeah, I was actually like racing the time to, to, to get the list in. I was going to play Team of Rhinos, but uh, there was like a late breaking kind of new combo, which was Leyline of the Guild Pact and Scion of Draco, where mm -hmm. if you start with Leyline in play, all your lands are all five colors or all five types. So Scion costs two mana and all your creatures are all five colors. So Scion grants itself Hexproof, Lifelink, Vigilance, First Strike and Trample already has flying. Wow. For two and mana? For two mana. And that also fits really nicely into the rhino's shell because some people had been playing uh leyline zoo domain zoo which you know is also good also has scion also has leyline has like territorial kavu and wild nakata and all that stuff but this is a combo of two cards that neither of them interfere with the rhino's plan uh -huh. and you get to play four copies of leyline binding as well so i was like you know what the theory is sound i will i will, I will try it and uh it ended up being very good. It was the best deck in the tournament by a pretty solid margin, had a highest win rate. And it felt wow. really good when I was playing it. Unfortunately, uh, I, I didn't quite get there. I went 7-4 drop, so I was not able to qualify for Pro Tour Seattle. Though I, I get another bite at the apple. I'm going to Chicago uh, next week, actually. And if I do well there, I could also queue for Seattle. But um, it, it was fun. I wish I would have done better, especially since like I actually had the right deck. Like You don't always have that or you know, and there aren't that many opportunities to have a deck that's like leaps and bounds ahead of the rest of the field. But this came basically like burst, burst onto the scene on Friday. So most people it was like going to be pretty hard for them to switch or they wouldn't want to. But I don't know. I'm in for some action. And uh, I also, yeah, I, I've used the Twitter bat signal to get cards before. I probably will do it again. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's one, of, <laughs> one of the advantages I guess I have. So I uh, might as well use it. Yeah. Wow. That's a good run. Hopefully you have a good one at Chicago. We'll both be there. Uh, next week, uh, I'll be doing coverage and Luis will be playing in the PT. Hopefully, you'll be watching along with us. Uh, for this episode of the show, we've got the slightly late Rare and Mythic Rare uh, set review for Murders at Karlov Manor. Thanks for your patience with that one. Uh, I was sick last week. Pretty bad. I'm feeling a lot better now, though, and uh, ready to dive in to these uh, to the Rares and Mythics. We're going to cover every single one of them um, in the set, as well as the what we call it the bonus sheet or the list. Uh, which are cards that are time shifted from other sets. Uh, and we're going to go over all of them. Before we do, we want to thank everybody on our Patreon for supporting us. Thank you so much. Uh, Patreon.com slash limited resources is where you can go. If you like what we do here, if you find what we do useful, uh, that's where you can go to support us. And we really appreciate everybody who does support us over there. Also, Ultimate Guard, the best place to get supplies for all of your magic needs. That's sleeves, deck boxes, ways to organize and carry your cards. They have the best products in the business over at Ultimate Guard. You can check them out at Ultimate Guard uh, at their actual website at ultimateguard.com and you can purchase stuff via your local game store or your favorite online retailer. Thank you so much, Ultimate Guard, for sponsoring the show. Um, Luis, we're gonna go over every card. We're gonna talk in depth about what the cards do, read them out, etc. But one thing that will certainly happen as well is we're gonna be giving them a grade. Yeah, and so our grading scale, uh, as usual, is A through F. So we uh, use letter grades and we've got two subgrades. So A's are the best cards in the set, the game breakers, the bombs. And we're actually going to see a lot of those because it's the rare mythic review. We're talking cards like Bonehorn Dracosaur, Polanyi's Hatcher, Sanguine Evangelist. B's are cards that actively pull you towards their colors. So these are among the best cards, just not the tippity top. Very solid cards you're pretty happy to take uh, in the first couple of picks. We're talking cards like Zoetic Glyph or Deep Cavern Bat. C's are playables. These are, uh, as you all say, the pawns of limited, the cards that are fairly interchangeable, but you don't really feel bad when you're playing them. You're not going to see a lot of those cards in this review. Rares tend to cluster at the tops and bottoms of the scale. So these are cards like Petrify or Atali's Favor. D's are cards that you're pretty unhappy to run. They're playable in a pinch, but you, you really aren't, aren't thrilled if you have to. And uh, they end up being kind of weak cards or too expensive or too situational cards like Sage of Days or Primordial Gnar. And then Fs are cards that are 
virtually unplayable. Like they either cost 10 mana, they refer to planeswalkers, they, you know, do do things that don't really make sense in the context of limited. And you're going to see a fair amount of those typically in the rare and mythic review as well, just because of how the rares tend to be. Like some of them just aren't really meant for limited. And uh, these are cards like the Enigma Jewel or Contested Game Ball. The two subgrades are sideboard, which <coughs> cards that aren't that great in your main deck, but can be very good out of the board. You're not going to see a lot of those here. Rares don't really tend to have the sideboard kind of capabilities, though. Every now and then you'll find one. But the last subgrade, build around or last category, you will definitely see some build arounds here because rares have uh, cards that don't do much or anything on their own. But if you combine them with the right other cards, can be awesome. And those are the ones that I'll probably look for the most as well. Uh, you know, that has felt like a category that's been lacking a little bit at the uncommon slot. And sometimes they can pump up the power level on a build around and make it actually worth it at rare. So we'll see what they've got here. We're going to start things off with blue. And that would be our, that means our first card is lost in the maze, which is X blue blue for an enchantment at rare. It's got flash. And it says when lost in the maze enters the battlefield, tap X target creatures, put a stun counter on each of those creatures you don't control and tapped creatures you control have hexproof. Uh, interesting to note that the tap creatures you control have hexproof is just text on the card. Uh, technically, you could just pay blue blue for a flash enchantment that gives that static ability to all of your creatures, but um, it could be relevant in a awkward pinch where <laughs> your opponent tries to use some type of removal spell pre-combat and you tap down your own creature to save it while tapping down a few of theirs as well. Yeah, this, this is a nice modal card where one part of the card is a big stun spell, right? You can imagine drawing this when you're at seven lands, tapping their whole team and stunning it, and you just we just win the game easily. Uh, and then some part of it is a protection spell where you cast it in response to a removal spell. That flexibility is pretty good, and mm -hmm. this is a, a solid card. It's a little on the expensive side, especially uh, – when you're comparing it to the, the common version of this, which is three and a blue to tap two creatures, stun them, and get a clue. Uh, investigate, like, yeah. Yeah, it does not compare favorably at that mana cost. For four mana, you get the same without the investigate. But the fact that this scales up to six, seven mana and protects your own creatures, it makes Lost in the, Bl in the, in the Maze, I think, a solid card. I, I would say it's probably like a C plus. Like it, yeah. it, not a game breaker, you know, in, in most games, but uh, it has the, the, the possibility to do a lot of different things. I will say that there are some matchups where this card could be really, really good. Definitely. Um, also, and it's, it's an interesting case study for the for quadrant theory, because one of the trickiest uh, quadrants to evaluate is when you're at parity and loss in the maze absolutely annihilates parity. Like if you have a built up board state against another built up board state, it is GG if, the, if you draw loss in the maze in the mid to late game. Um, I like C plus trending towards B minus for Lost in the Maze as well. Next is Prof's uh, Eidetic Memory. This one's funny because this is one of those cards that you kind of keep waiting for it to tell you what the bad news is, and there just isn't any. It's one in a blue for a legendary enchantment at rare. And when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. So two mana replaces itself. Um, it says you have no maximum hand size, which I know is a rule, Luis, that you would change uh, just in general. So <laughs> it's one step in that direction, I suppose. And then it says at the beginning <coughs> of combat on your turn, if you've drawn more than one card this turn, put X plus one plus one counters on target creature you control, where X is the number of cards you've drawn this turn minus one. Basically, yeah, so just if you draw more cards, it doesn't count the first one, but anything beyond that, you just start to get throwing counters around, and this thing just sits on the battlefield. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. It, straight up, this is two mana draw a card, put a plus one plus one counter uh, uh, on your on one of your creatures, and then it just racks up another one every time you draw an extra card, which is not hard to do. This card's very good. I, very I would good. always be happy to play it. You don't really want to cycle it on turn two, since you'll, you'll yep. miss that initial trigger. So, you know, keep in mind it's not like quite as free though you could do that if you were going to miss your third land drop yeah and, and you get the thing on the battlefield it could be worse but what's also nice is it it isn't one of those like this triggers once per turn sort of things where you know if you've drawn one or more cards this turn get a counter it, it, it does pay you if you scale up so like if you play this on turn six then crack two two more clues all of a sudden you're getting three plus one plus one counters on a creature mm -hmm. so that's right that, that can be pretty nice i, I would give prof's identic memory a b like I would it's too. just a card I'm not going to cut out of basically any deck. 
That's right. It, it has a classic high floor, and uh, that's yeah. awesome. Uh, next is case of the ransacked lab. This is two and a blue for an uh, for a case. This one's rare. It says instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. So I'm already kind of off it. Um, it just it to solve it. You've cast four or more instants and sorceries this turn, and then I guess I'll read solved just for fun. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, draw a card. This is cool, but I, I still I cannot imagine a world where I could successfully build around this thing. No, case of the ransack labs an F. You just yeah. can't you can't put a card in your deck that needs you to cast four spells in the same turn in order to be good, and that's what this is saying. Right, unfortunately, because it is cool. Uh, next is. This is a really weird one. Uh, Coveted Falcon. I had to read it like three times and then somebody played it against me. And I'm like, okay, that's what it does. It's one blue <laughs> blue for a one four flying artifact creature bird. This one's just rare. So can we, what do you think of one blue blue for a one four flyer? That's fine. It's not like crazy good. And it is one blue blue, not two and a blue, which yeah. means that some of the times... It may seem funny that we kind of harp a little bit on like double color costs because throughout Magic's history, a lot of cards t tend to have those. Though They do less of those these days, mm -hmm. uh, especially at lower rarities. And part of that is a lot of the strength of a three mana one four flyer is casting it on turn three and having a good stack card for that turn. It, if you were planning on casting this on turn three and you're not able to as a one four, though, it does have disguise. So you could always play it face down. It, it does lose a lot of its luster. So, yeah. Uh, you know, a 1-4 flyer for three is a solid base rate. You know, you said Gitaxian Raptor and uh, all, all will be one. But I think that uh, you're going to need a lot more than that to make me really interested in the card. And the card does have more going on. Yeah, so as you mentioned, it has Disguise. So you can cast it face down for three and turn it up for one and a blue. And it says, uh, when it is turned face up, target opponent gains control of any number of target permanents you control. And then you draw a card for each one they gain this way. So you can give them your stuff. And for each stuff you give, you draw a card. It's very strange. But then it kind of, the joke becomes apparent here when you see the other ability that it has, which is whenever Coveted Falcon attacks, gain control of target permanent you own, but don't control. So, so let me describe again, the, the, the pattern a little bit here. Yeah, go you, for it. If you like. Mm -hmm. So like you 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 disguise this, right? And then <laughs> you're like, end of your turn, flip this up, give you a land, because you it's not a non-land permanent, it's just any permanent. Draw a card and then attack and take the land back. So that, that's like the simple one, which is you you draw a card, you end up drawing a card. You flip it up and draw a card, and they get temporary possession of a land which is even tapped. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to give them untapped things. <laughs> The, the, the part where it gets kind of interesting is when you use Coveted Falcon, you give them two or three things or or more, though that sounds kind of crazy, under the hope that like it'll attack and steal back all the all the things. It's like, you you know, you, you, you sold them something and then send your Falcon to go steal it back. You already got paid for it, though. You drew a card for each one. Mm -hmm. The other and, and so the risk there is, of course, that if you do that and then they go, OK, kill your Falcon, then you, you still aren't down cards in the sense that well, you are because you you traded three cards to draw three, which is even. But then they got those cards, so mm -hmm. you are down cards in that sense. But if you're giving them lands in the late game, let's say you give them two lands, that's not going to be generally a disaster. Obviously, you can give them a creature if you're really feeling it. Uh, yeah, or you know, or some material that you have on the board that you deem useless. Yeah, and you can't you can't target try to give them a clue and then crack it in response. You won't draw a card off of the Falcon. It, it has to be given to them in order mm -hmm. to, to do that. Overall, this is a cute idea. It's a funny little sub game. I don't think this card's very good. I just think it's a little bit too slow. Cause like compare this to a, a, a disguise creature. Let's say it had all the same stats and the disguise was like six mana. When you flip it up, draw three cards. Mm -hmm. but, like which one of these would be better? Like, I don't, I don't know that, I, that this Falcon, you know, is better than that. Cause like, if you want to draw three cards off this Falcon, you have to give them three permanents and you only even get back one right away. You're, yeah. you're giving them turns with these, those other cards. Yeah. The, the interesting part with this card is trying to imagine the blowout scenario and it's actually quite difficult, you know? When you really, we you know, think of what would be the just, oh my God, you know, you, you ship them a bunch of what, right? That's the, that's the problem you know, O ones or something would be, you know, on the list where you're like, yeah, I don't care. They're down. Those are down on the ground. I'm playing blue. 
you know, enjoy your plant tokens or whatever, but that there, there's not an easy setup to make that work. So what happens most of the time that I've seen this card is you'll get shipped one or two things or ship them one or two things. You'll take the important one back right away. And then you'll try to, you'll live with the fact that if they have to use a burn, you know, a removal spell on your Falcon before <laughs> you get the other one back, you're fine with it. You're, you're at least okay with it. But you know, in modern limited, that is very much board centric and fast, you know, giving your opponent on board material that you've already spent mana for invested resources in is, is tantamount to just losing the game. Uh, it's, it's the exact opposite of what you'd want. You'd almost rather like take their stuff and give them cards and be like, okay, I'm going to beat you with this stuff before you can leverage the cards. And, and you're taking on that burden yourself. Um, that said, you know, it's not the worst, right? It's, it still has okay stats. You can still just chuck them a tap land tack. All you have to do is turn the thing sideways. So if they're tapped out, you make it to combat. It doesn't even matter if it hits them and you get the card, you get your land back and you get the card to boot. So you could be up a card on it, you know, without asking too much of you, you know, so it certainly is playable. Yeah, but I, I would just give it a C. I don't think it's, Agreed. I don't think it's better than that. It's just not, it's not a card that I think has that high of a high end and it's a, it's just mostly going to be a kind of medium card. Like there are opportunities for it to be good, but I think Coded Falcon is a little bit too much hustle and bustle for what you get. Agreed. But I like the design and I like, I, I'm hoping to get some good stories out of it uh, down the line <laughs> for sure. Uh, next is Cryptic Coat. This is two and a blue for an artifact equipment. This thing is rare. And uh, it says when it enters the battlefield, cloak the top card of your library, then attach cryptic coat to it. Now, being an equipment, it does augment the, the creature and the creature gets plus one plus oh and can't be blocked. So it actually makes it quite good. Two and a blue and you get a three, two hex proof or sorry, um, ward two unblockable. And this is the crazy part. You can pay one and a blue to return cryptic coat to its owner's hand, which then allows you to pay the two and a blue to cast it and just do this again. And by the way, it, this doesn't, I mean, it does affect the underlying creature and that it doesn't get unblockable and plus one plus all, but it doesn't like disappear. Like you, if you have mana in the late game, you could just loop this thing through and just populate out a board of, of uh, cloaked creatures with just this one cryptic code. It's actually insane. Yeah. And, and you know, if you, if you do spike creatures, you can, you can turn them face up, but Honestly, that's not really necessary. This is just one of the best cards in the set. One of the best cards I've ever seen for limited, honestly. Like three mana, three, two, un unblockable ward two would just be a hell of a card to begin with. Yeah, that's a and really annoying like, card. This is that, but like unkillable and you can just make more creatures at will. Yes. You should not only never pass this if you're even thinking about playing blue. If you open this in pack two, you should very strongly consider taking it and either trying to splash it, though it, it is a card that rewards double blue. Uh, because being able to have the loop of play it, return it, return it, play it, play it, return it, like all in the same turn is nice. Mm -hmm. But splashing it is fine or switching to, to blue. Cryptic Code is that good. Uh, it's just an absurd card. So I, I would give it an A+. Plus. Yeah. I think this is this is the kind of card that just you dream about opening. Definitely. I've never beaten it, and I have never lost when I started casting it. Uh, next is Forensic Gadgeteer. This is two and a blue for a uh, Vidalcan artificer detective at rare it's a two three and it says whenever you cast an artifact spell investigate so that's a nice static ability and then it says activated abilities of artifacts you control cost one less to activate this effect can't reduce the mana of that cost to less than one mana so i i really wanted to like this card and and you know especially since we we kind of pushed the review back a little more we've had more time to play mm -hmm. i've played with this card in, in two different decks now my main problem with this card is there's not actually that many ways to trigger it. Yeah. There, there aren't that many artifacts in the set. There are a lot of cards that make clues, and that's still a combo. Making your clues half half off, like just one to crack, that's still pretty good. That's, that's not huge. a mm -hmm. that's not a weak ability. But my experience with the card is it doesn't make very many clues over the course of the game. So it's still a potentially good card. It's it's a build around for sure. Like this was firmly in the build around camp. And I would give it a build around B because if you can build around it, if you can get seven or eight artifacts in your deck and, and a bunch of other cards that make clues, like you can kind of get something going. It's even a detective. But 
this is this is uh one of the the, the cards that ha- had we reviewed the cards without playing with them i would be a lot higher on the card this card has disappointed me twice and i think that it's yeah just not as good as it, it looks just the context of the format just doesn't really fit with it so yeah it's a build around but not one i think you should be that excited to go for yeah, it's really tough when you have an artifact in your hand like three two vigilance <laughs> that you want, but you often just end up disguising it anyway. So you're just like never getting the trigger off the gadget here. Still build around B. Uh, next is Steam Core Scholar. What does this guy do? This is two and a blue for a two two uh, flying vigilance. It's a weird detective, as in it's like you know Steam Core weird. It's that's that's creature type. <laughs> and uh, when it enters the battlefield, so it's a three mana two two flying vigilance, already good. When it enters the battlefield, draw two cards and then discard two cards unless you discard an instant or sorcery card or a creature with flying. So it actually has like a ton of ways to get out of discarding two while also being a three mana two two flying and vigilance. Like worst comes to worst, you draw two, discard two, so you got a little card filtering while also getting a really undercosted flyer. So uh, this this card's awesome. It's it's not hard to only discard one, and it's also pretty easy to be happy even if you don't. So I would give Steam Core Scholar an A minus. Like, oh, you like it that much, huh? Yeah, I think it's just a really good card. I was gonna give it a B. <clears throat> Maybe I'm a little. I think low. it just plays a lot better than that. I mean, just imagine it's a yeah, flying no, drifter for three mana. <laughs> mm. Like, if you draw two, discard one. It's a. Uh, it's just such a good deal. Like you're, you, you can ship off of your, can, can we not, two, can two we not compare it to Moldrifter though? Like that's, that's, no, you're right. This costs three. Moldrifter would be too slow in the, this day and age. <laughs> uh, what does reenact the crime do? It does nothing. It's a uh, one blue, blue, blue for an instant at rare exile target, non-land card in a graveyard that was put there from anywhere this turn. So any card that went yeah. to a graveyard for any reason, no, F. you can copy it and cast the copy without paying its mana cost. But it's just a really bad card because it's so situational and has three blue pips. So it's like, when is this card gonna gonna be good? There are times, but they are very very narrow. Yeah, we call this setup cost, right? You just need too many things to line up properly to make this card actually. Good. I, I, I just imagine. Think, I don't think I'd ever the, play it. The perfect card gets discarded or milled, but you're on two mountains and two islands. Yeah, like, right. I, I get that probably for constructed this card, you know, it, it does have some potential and like maybe it would be too easy if it cost a different cost. But uh, yeah, it's pretty rough for limited. So I would give Reenact the Crime an F. I, I just don't too. think you should try to play this card. No. The next one though, next mm. one's really nice. It's Intrude on the Mind. Three blue, blue, instant at Mythic Rare. And it says, reveal the top five cards of your library and separate them into two piles. So you're the one who chooses which these piles are. Yeah. Both players see all, all cards. They're all face up. And then your opponent chooses one of those piles to go to your hand and the other go to your graveyard. Okay, so it's factor fiction. If you've played with factor fiction, uh, it's kind of like a reverse because your your opponent's the one who who, who splits it. But uh, the other twist on this is you then get a zero zero colorless thopter artifact with flying that that has a plus one plus one counter on it for each card put in your graveyard with this. So it's awesome. What that means is. Let's say you split 3-2. Your opponent's like, well, I only want you to have the two-card pile. Well, then you get a 3-3. You spent five mana at instant speed to get a 3-3 that draws you two cards. Like, that is awesome. If you split it 3-2 and they want to give you the – and they don't, they can't deal with a 3-3, then you get to draw three cards and get a 2-2. Right. And you're allowed to split it like 4-1 if you want. Like, imagine – I can imagine a 5-0 split with this card. If your opponent's at five life, at the end of your turn, their turn you cast this, you should just split it and they don't have any blockers or tapped out, whatever. Split it 5-0 because their options are to either give you a 5-5 a, a five, five and die or you draw five cards. Or if you want, even maybe you could go 4-1 because it's like, well, you know, they I, I want at least a 1-1 one, one Thopter if, uh, if, mm-hmm. if, you know, if, if, at the very worst. So, uh it's a really, really strong card. It's, it plays well at instant speed, and it's a pretty cool design. So I, I would give Intrude on the Mind an, an A as well. Like, yeah. I just it's just really strong card. There's no option that is is bad. It, the, the, all the options are great. That's what you realize the first time you cast it. You just everything's good. <laughs> Sometimes you can make a mistake with Factor Fiction with Intrude on the Mind. You really can't. Um, yeah, I like A for Intrude on the Mind. Uh, last blue card is Conspiracy Unraveler. This is five blue blue for a 6-6 six, six flying Sphinx Detective at Mythic. And it says you may collect evidence 10 rather than pay the mana cost for spells that you cast. 
Unfortunately, you have to get the seven mana behemoth on the battlefield before you do. Yeah, I I don't think that uh, that Conspiracy Unraveler is a card that you're you're really going to want to play a lot of. A seven mana six six flying with unability is still is still a card that you you could put in some decks for sure. If your deck's well suited to cast seven mana spells, it's not the worst. And sometimes you'll cast this and just immediately cast a five drop out of your hand. You probably can't yeah. cast like more than one card because evidence ten is a lot and. After you've cast a seven drop, you typically don't have like more than two cards in your hand or something. Yeah. But that can lead to a pretty big swing if you if you can do that. And there's there's decks and there's matchups where I can imagine this card being being solid. Man, I it just it just does all the things that I don't want. You know what I mean? Like it, it it's it's a not necessarily board affecting seven drop. I mean it is it, sorry, it does affect board six six flyer, but I mean uh, board swinging seven drop it's still just like they can just kill it and then the game's over and it didn't you know gain me some life or leave back a chump block or anything um and then but like you said by the time you get seven mana you generally can cast any card in your deck anyway you may be able to sneak one out of your hand for free you know the same turn as you mentioned which you know that is powerful if you can do it but as you also mentioned it just doesn't happen that often i i would avoid conspiracy unraveler um, if I could, like this is, if I open this card, it's not on my radar. It's not something that I would aim for. I wouldn't build around it. I wouldn't build towards it. So I just don't really know where it fits for me. Um, just doesn't give I me anything say, that I really want, you know? Yeah. I guess I would still call it like a C though. I feel like it's, it's a card that you could just put in your deck. If you're, if you're, if you're capable of ramping, like it's hard to turn down a six, six flyer. And that is true. I think, I think if your opponent cast, like it's a seven. So, you, so spell, you're green they, blue and this is a fine seven. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. It's but just tough. Cause I, I know that probably I, I, closer I, to a, to a C minus or D. Yeah. Though. It's like a D. I mean, I, you know, cause I compare it to like the seven mana green spider, for example, you know, that puts three counters around has reach and gains you life. You know, it's pretty tough to lose the game the turn after you cast that spider, but that's not really as true here for the unraveler. I would give it a D. Yeah, I actually like D for Conspiracy Unraveler. That seems reasonable. Um, case of the Stash Skeleton is our first black card. It is one and a black uh, for a case at rare. And when it ETBs, you get a 2-1 black skeleton creature token and you suspect it. And then in order to solve this, you control no suspected skeleton. So either it dies or you unsuspect it somehow. And this is really great. If it's solved, you can pay one and a black and sacrifice it to search your library uh, for a card, put it in your hand, and then shuffle at sorcery speed. I mean, yeah, so just at the baseline, that's giving you an extra card. It happens to give you the, whatever the best card in your deck is at that point as well. And especially if you're a, an assertive deck, which is the, where you, really where you want this, a two-mana, two-one menace is is a totally good deal. Totally. It's a two-mana, two-one menace that punishes them if they kill it. Right. And it so, punches them quite badly, actually. Yeah, like, give your opponent a card. Demonic and, Tutor is sick. <laughs> yeah. So I've really liked Case of the Stash Skeleton. I've played it and played against it, and I've been impressed every time. I mean, you know, it just as a shortcut in your mind, what if it was just, you know, two mana, two one, you know, suspected, and then, you know, whenever you didn't have one, you just get to draw a card or pay two to, you know, get a clue, right? It's like, well, this is like the best clue you've ever seen in your entire life, <laughs> you know? So... It is a two for one, and it's better than that as well because it gives you a selection. I, I like B plus for a case of the stash skeleton. I, it, it asks almost nothing of you. It fits well into any assertive, aggressive deck, and it pays you back really nicely. Yeah, I, I, I like B plus as well. Just don't put this in a defensive deck unless you have mm -hmm. ways to like sacrifice it for value, which there aren't like tons of, mm -hmm. because otherwise your opponent could just kind of ignore this and you don't get anything out of it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, next is Homicide Investigator. This is one in a black for a 2-2 human detective at rare. And it says whenever one or more non-token creatures you control die, investigate. There is a caveat. It only triggers once each turn. But like whenever one of your non-tokens dies, you just get to investigate every time. It's just, I, I mean, this is a very powerful card for two mana. Yeah, you, you just need to get one trigger out of this and you've already paid for itself and it's really trivial to get multiples. Also, it's a two mana card that probably like you probably play this and either get a trigger right away or, or force your opponent to not block. And then if your opponent kills this, then 
you, you're like up a little tempo or up a little a card and they probably spent more mana or at least equivalent mana to, to yours in order to stop it. So I, I think homicide investigator is awesome. Uh, I would give it, I would give it an a minus. Like this is the kind of card I'd always be happy to play. And yeah, the, the main thing you want to look for is like kind of have a creature heavy deck, but that's not too difficult to come up with. Yeah. I like a minus for homicide investigator as well. Next is outrageous robbery, which is black, black X for an instant at rare. And it says target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library face down. You may look at and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. If you cast a spell this way, you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast it. I'm curious what you think about this one, Luis. I've I've had experience with and against this card. Um, you know, mana mana wise, it is a little bit much. But I mean, I've had it turn into four or five cards. You know, a few times uh, both on both my side and my opponent's side. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's a little weak. It's, it's pretty expensive. Like, and part of it is, uh, I don't think the black decks are great at like getting ahead. Like how are, how are they getting into a board position where you can take a turn off to cast this? Mm. But if you can, it is good. If you can spend five or six mana on this, it's just, it's basically casting a five or six mana card draw spell. Right. It, it's probably on balance a little bit worse because spells from their deck are generally going to be weaker than spells from your deck just because they don't fit with what you're doing. And also, one of what the if things, they don't listen to LR? Like, Oh, yeah, then, that, then, then, then they're probably really a little really stronger, bad. you're right. Uh, yeah. But the, the, the thing about being able to spend mana of any type – well, if you if you disguise a creature off of this, you do, you you still have to pay the actual disguise cost to flip it up. So, mm, mm-hmm. um, you're you're not going to be able to 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 do that quite as easily. But yeah, overall, I think outrageous robbery is a bit slow. I just don't think straight up card draw spells are exactly what you want. Even at instant speed, I, I wouldn't really be too stoked to play this. So, I I, give, I, I give, still give it a C though. I think it's a C. I just don't think it's like a super excited card. I agree. The, the, the high end is there though. Like you, yes. this is type of card that you can draw when you're stalled out or, you know, late in the game and it, it's a blowout. Next is hunted bone brute, which is interesting one. It's two and a black for a six, two with menace. And it's a skeleton beast at rare. Uh, and it says when it enters the battlefield, the target opponent creates two one, one white dog creature tokens, which uh, depending on how long you've played, that might not sound like much, or that might sound like too much. Uh, it's a lot. Like giving yeah. them two one ones is is a really major downside. But here's the deal: it has disguise for one and a black, and it says when it dies, each opponent loses three life. So uh, uh, the the gameplay pattern is just to simply play it as a face down card turn it up with disguise. You lose the downside of the dogs coming down on the other side. You still get the six, two menace. And when it dies, which they really have to kill it quickly, they lose three life. The cards awesome. It's just, you really do have to, uh, and, and unless it's a weird scenario, you have to disguise it, but that's the only caveat with it. And who cares? You do that all the time anyway. Yeah. This card is awesome. It's uh, sweet. I, I, I think you're basically never going to play it face up unless yeah. you have like, a specific reason to just like do that right away. And when you, when you flip it up, the fact that it is menace is really what, what I think gets it going because Definitely. you end up in a spot where you can often just flip this up and get one big hit for six in, at which point it can trade for anything like, you know, like any removal spell pretty much kills it like a shock or something. But if you got that one hidden when they're tapped out, they're just staring down the barrel of, at best, trading a, a, a removal spell and losing three life, so to down nine life, and you spent five mana total, it's not even that much, or trading two creatures for it, which they have to then leave back. And if you have like a removal spell or a pump spell, you can really wreck them. Or you just trade this for two creatures and they're down nine life and two creatures for your five mana total investment. It, it's a great card. Like a uh, hunt, Hunted Bone Brood is awesome. I would give it a B plus. I don't think it's a, it's yeah. quite bomb level, but, uh, I, I do, I do like it. It's definitely knocking at the door. I can't wait to hear what you think of this next card. You know how sometimes early in a format, a card will kind of follow you around the Barb Servitor is the one that's been for me. I've just opened this card a hundred times when I've been in black and I've tried it out a bunch of times and I want to know what you think, Luis, it's three in a black for a one, one artifact creature construct at rare, but it's indestructible. And when it ETBs, you suspect it. So you're paying four mana for a 1-1 indestructible 
suspected card. And it says, whenever it deals, <coughs> excuse me, combat damage to a player, you draw a card and lose a life. And whenever it is dealt damage, target opponent loses that much life. Yeah, I don't think this card's very good. I think it's just too slow. Like, obviously, if it could block, you know, if it wasn't suspected, this card would be obscene. So there's a reason they they do that. And there are ways to remove the suspicion from it if you if you want, but that seems like a lot of work. Mostly it's like you're gonna cast this, it doesn't do anything. Next turn, you can attack with this. You you're down on board because you spent turn four casting a card that did, had no effect on 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 the battlefield. And then once you start attacking with it, they'll probably just take it and you draw a card and lose a life. So you're now down another life, which, yeah, obviously there is some power in that, especially if you can convert, if you've got life gain or if you were able to, again, just like Outrageous Robbery, stabilize and then play this. It, it is a pretty hard card to deal with, but there still are also solutions to it. If like makeshift binding or what have you, like if they, you know, exile effects, bounce effects. Minus X, minus X works on it. Oh yeah, that just really dies badly to the X and a black, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it sure does. And common. So, I think overall the upside is there. Like there is a theoretical upside, but the downside of this being dead too often makes me not typically going to want to play Barb Servitor. I think this card is closer to a D than a B. Like yeah. you, you, you can give it a C and say that like, hey, you can build a kind of deck or, or that uses this as its like way to get card advantage and close out the game, but. Honestly, I think there's way too many things that go wrong. And sometimes even if they don't have an answer of any kind, it's just not a card you can necessarily cast and, and, and hope to have work. So that looks like a D to me. You nailed it. That's exactly the how it plays out. It plays out pretty well. Like you play it, you just you, you get to just mindlessly turn it sideways because you don't care what they do. If they double block, they take like five. And if they don't, then you start drawing extra cards, which can get out of control pretty quickly. So it is powerful. But the indestructible part just doesn't hold up as well as you would think in a normal set. And that's a huge knock because you are spending four mana on a non blocker and it really needs like bare minimum. It needs to start swinging the next turn and, and doing the thing. And if it's not doing that under really any circumstance you can, and there's multiple removal spells that kill it. So yeah, it's like a C minus or something like that. I even took off the um, suspect on it before and it still didn't crush. Um, next is illicit masquerade. This is three and a black for an enchantment at rare. It's got flash. And when it enters the battlefield, you put an imposter counter on each creature you control. And then it says, whenever a creature you control with an imposter counter on it dies, exile it, and then return up to one other target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. I just can't be bothered to try out cards like this. No, like, look, look, look the, the idea here is like, you know, you play this, you have three creatures in play and three creatures in your graveyard. And then every yes. time one of your creatures dies, you get a you get a immediate just zombify straight into the battlefield. But this requires you to have creatures in play and in graveyard <clears throat> and like a good amount, like not just like one, like at least two and two. That's just, I think, way too situational. And if they yeah. ever bounce or exile or any of those things the creatures you have in play because they have they have to they have to have the imposter counter it's not like this just sits in play and does more stuff like right it, it yeah this looks like an f to me it's, it's just way f. too way too slow and situational next card's not massacre girl known killer is two black black for a four four legendary human assassin she's mythic rare she's got menace so four mana four four menace and creatures you control have wither and wither means that they deal damage to creatures in the form of minus one, minus one counters rather than regular damage. Um, and it says whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, if its toughness was less than zero, excuse me, less than one, draw a card. Yeah, this card is obscene. I, 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 I awesome. have gotten to play with this one. I had it in one of my first drafts. And basically it's a four mana, four, four menace that you know, if they try to take it out in combat, probably trades for at least one creature, maybe one and a half because it leaves wither counters back and also uh, draws you a card. But it also means whenever you're, one of your creatures battles with one of theirs, you draw a card. And even more than that, whenever you cast one of the minus X minus X spells to kill a creature, you yep. also draw a card. Yes. Like you just draw a card when almost anything happens. And a four mana, four, four menace wither would already be good. So yep. I, I would give Massacre Girl an A. I would too. And she's played out like that, especially in black where there's enough removal that actually complements her too. 
Uh, next is Deadly Cover Up. This is three black black for a sorcery at rare. As it says, an additional co cost to cast this spell, you may collect evidence six. Uh, headliner, destroy all creatures. So five mana, sorcery, destroy all creatures. And then if you did collect evidence, you can exile a card from an opponent's graveyard, then search its owner's graveyard, hand, and library for any number of cards with that name and exile them. That player shuffles, then draws a card for each card exiled from their hand this way. Puts all this extra text on there that I, I don't know, must be constructed specific. I, you can free roll this. Um, you get to exile a card from their graveyard. You can exile the rest. If it's not even a particularly amazing card and they have one in their hand, you can leave it and exile the rest. Yeah. But the headliner, of course, is three black, black, destroy all creatures. And I've had this card numerous times and it's performed quite well. Like it is exactly what you would think in the format. It is a very reasonable sweeper. It's very nice to not really have to care about what's under their disguise. You know, you always have to be wary of this stuff when you're thinking about when and how to use your removal and combat and stuff. And deadly cover up just says, I don't care. You know, just tap five man and blow up everything. It's kind of nice. Yeah, I think this is a, a, a totally solid card if you want a wrath. Like the, the additional text is basically irrelevant. I think yeah. it wouldn't change the grade one way or another. But you do get to look at their hand, I guess, if you if you if you have the ability to do some collecting of evidence. And I would say that Deadly Cover Up looks like a B. It's me. a B. Yeah. It plays like a B. Uh last card is Vein Ripper, which is three black, black, black for a six five flying vampire assassin at Mythic Rare. And the ward cost on it is sacrifice a creature. So that's really tough. And then whenever a creature dies, target, geez, target opponent loses two life and you gain two life. You get to drain them for two when anything dies. And if they want to target this, they have to sacrifice a creature. And so you immediately get one on the house. <laughs> that's incredible. Um, this card is amazing if you can cast it. That's that's yeah. the only caveat is that it does cost three black, black, black. So triple black, you need to be base black and hopefully have, you know, 10-ish swamps in your deck. But if you get to that point, Vein Ripper's awesome. Yeah. I I mean, I would give Vein Ripper an A+. Plus. Like, yeah. this is just a, a scary bomb you can think of. And and it, it does exactly what <laughs> what you would expect a mythic called Vein Ripper to do. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, let's move on to red. Uh, what's our first card? Connecting the it's dots. A, connecting the dots. It's a, we're in a red for an enchantment. It's got the conspiracy guy with like the the all the all the, the paper oh, and the string on the wall it, and stuff. That's uh, cool. And, it, and it's a rare. And it says whenever a creature you control attacks, exile the top card of your library face down. You cannot look at it. It tells you very clearly. And you can pay one in a red and discard your hand, sacrifice connecting the dots, and put all the exiled cards into your hand. So basically, this kind of says. Whenever one of your creatures attacks, draw a card, except you don't get the cards until one big burst and you have to, you know, forsake your hand and getting all new cards. But, you know, you're, you're kind of imagining a, a red aggro deck and you're just like, I have a low curve, I have a lot of attackers, I'll stack three or four or five cards under this and then I'll get a hand refresh. I think in practice, that's just not going to happen that much. And I would, I would generally shy away from this, I would say. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, it is powerful as one of your very, very few non-board affecting cards in a good aggressive red deck, it's just, it's so specific. It doesn't do anything to get the damage through at that point, which can be really, really damaging. You do need to get it down early. You can't wait until you've curved out and then play it. I mean, of course you can, but it's better the earlier you get it down. So that stuff, you don't really want to replace your two drop necessarily. And you do have to give up your hand. That being said, you know, this thing can give you seven new cards, depending on what your board state is and how far ahead you are. I yeah. don't tend to value cards like this super highly, even though I do recognize that the ceiling is actually legitimately quite high on connecting the dots. I, I would take it and at the D level and give it a D. Um, it is too finicky for me to want to excitedly put into too many different decks but uh, the times when you do, if you're very selective about it, it, it will draw you a bunch of extra cards. Yeah, I think this card's probably a D, really an F, honestly. I just I just think that the times when th that you should play this in your deck are very few and very far between, where if you end up, and this is almost theoretically possible, in like 
mono red with a bunch of goblin mask makers and frantic scapegoats and and you know cheap two and three mana red creatures and burn spells, then yeah, I bet this card actually would be good in that deck. But most decks, it's just you can't spend two mana on this, have it do nothing, have it do nothing, have it do nothing for like so long, and then spend another two mana having to have it empty your hand already and attacked a bunch of times in order to draw five cards or four cards. And yeah, I would just not put, play Connected the Dots, which leads us into another card you shouldn't play. Expedited Inheritance is red, red. It's an enchantment at Mythic Rare. It says whenever a creature is dealt damage, its controller may exile that many cards from the top of their library, and they may and they may play those cards until the end of their next turn. It's not a weak ability, but it's just symmetrical. It's straight up symmetrical. You get no advantage being the player who casts this. So you're just down a card in two mana to cast this, and it even gives them the first crack at it a lot of times. Because imagine you cast this and attack, and they block, and the creatures trade. You probably can't play the card this turn, and they're probably going to get to play them. This card's an app. Do not put it in your deck. There's so just no... It's a real shame, too, because the combination of title, artwork, and flavor text on this card is just <laughs> an absolute beastly home run. I mean, seriously, Expedited Inheritance is, like, the absolute best, like, subtle way to describe, like, killing somebody or whatever yep. that I've ever heard in my life, and the card's just an F, so... At least they got a bunch of uh, other cool stuff right on it. <coughs> Excuse me. What does Fugitive Codebreaker do? This is a one in a red for a 2-1 Goblin Rogue at rare. It has prowess and haste. So two mana, two one prowess, haste is not a bad place to start. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm already, I'm already interested in that. A two drop in a three drop format is nice. It also has disguise and the disguise cost is five in a red, but this cost is reduced by one for each instant sorcerer in your graveyard. And when you turn Fugitive Codebreaker face up, you discard your hand and draw three cards. So this is very clearly a Bedlam Reveler callback mm-hmm. where you, you, the idea here is you either play this as like a two mana, two one haste, right? You're on the play, you play this, hit them for two, they play a creature, you maybe like shock it, attack for three, play another two drop, right? You're just playing the beatdown roll. Or you disguise this in your like blue red spells deck that's casting deduces and shocks and uh, you know w- whatever other spells here uh, you you might want demand answers right you discard you cast it discarding a spell to draw two more cards and and then once your hand's empty you spend like two or three mana maybe even less to flip this and then draw three cards and that, that's pretty sweet too so I like the two halves you're not going to get the like max you know, value flip that often where you're like, I'm going to spend one mana to flip this and discard no cards, but you are going to get always the option to have a two mana, two one prowess haste, which is again, a card I would put in my deck most of the time. Like, you know, red herring, the, the two mana, mm-hmm. two, two haste clue fish. I mm-hmm. like that card. That card Me too. Good. Yeah. I lose to it deck. all the time. Yeah. And this card does a lot of that same thing with a lot higher upside on the, on the back end. So I like B for fugitive yeah. breaker. I think the card is just good. Yeah. Same. B for Fugitive Codebreaker. Next is Pyrotechnic Performer. This is one in a red for a 3-2 Viachino Assassin at rare. It's got Disguise, single red, and whenever it or another creature you control is turned face up, that creature deals damage equal to its power to each opponent. So just the, the Pyrotechnic Performer here has many awesome rolls. I mean, it can be a 3-2 on turn two, which is quite big. In this format, it's not the most amazing because it trades off for any disguised creature. So generally, you'll want to disguise this and then pay the red to flip it up. But if you do, it does three damage to them. And, you know, I played it pretty aggressively when I opened it early in the format. And I realized later on that I should actually just sit back on it and let it just be a static ability, um, turn it face up and then start turning other creatures face up because the damage adds up huge. Like you're getting big, big chunks of damage in three damage, four damage here, just for simple, simply doing what you were going to do anyway, which is, you know, trans uh, flip up your disguise creatures. This car's awesome. Yeah, I mean, th- this is one where, yeah, you get the two mana three two part, which is great. Like, that's also a great card. But mostly, like you said, you're just kind of sitting on this one. It doesn't cost much to flip. And when it's in play, your opponent have to kill it or they just know they're going to be whittled down in pretty big chunks, honestly, by your un- undercover crocodiles and, you know, Blitz Hellions and stuff like that. It, they just die really fast. Uh, I would give an A minus to Pyrotechnic Performer. It's yeah, it, it, it's, it's definitely it's in the a, it's either an A or A minus. I mean, it, it's honestly, like every time I've had this thing, I'm like, this card is just unreal. Like it does so much extra damage. It doesn't even ask that much of you. Uh, next is case of the crimson pulse. This is two and a red 
for a, an enchantment case at rare. And it says when it enters the battlefield, discard a card, then draw two cards. So sorcery speed, that effect. And then it says to solve, you have no cards in hand. And if it's solved at the beginning of your upkeep, discard your hand, then draw two cards. What do you think about this card? So I, have yet, I have yet to play with it. Um, I think it's okay. Like it's a, it's not great, but if it, this is kind of like what a uh, connect the dots is trying to do, but actually yeah. good. Yeah. But actually it's, worth it's kind, it. Yeah. It's kind of how I see it. Cause it's a three mana tormenting voice. Yeah. You, know, you pay three, you discard a card and you draw two cards. So you're like, you're kind of overpaying by, by one plus, you know, those, those effects often come with like a little bit of extra value sometimes or what have you. So, so that start isn't good, especially in a, in a format where your three drop slots pretty contested. But if if you have a low curve deck and you can play this as one of your your last cards and then soon empty your hand, I mean, drawing two cards extra a turn is absurd. You don't get to keep them because every turn you're discarding your hand on the beginning of your upkeep. But mm -hmm. if you start out with six lands, no cards in hand, you draw two, then you draw one for your turn, you're probably playing at least two of those. You're going to go land spell and most likely land spell spell. And then even if you do have to discard one of those cards here and there, like you're drawing three cards a turn. Who cares? Yeah. So totally. I, I, you're playing yeah, the best two of the three cards you've drawn for the turn. I mean, that game ends real quick. I think Case of the Crimson Pulse <clears throat> is more like a C, C minus level card. But yeah. if you had to have a low curve, I could see this being like a C plus. I, I will say, like, I had a really low curve red, white, aggressive uh, opponent play this as like on turn five or six. And it I felt pressure to to beat them before they got to zero cards. Cause once they do, if you're not beating them, like they're, they are, they're going to beat you down pretty hard. Yeah. The only downside for your opponent there is that the chance that you beat them went up the turn that they cast case of the crimson pulse as, you know, it did not do anything to the board that turn. Um, next is Cranko Baron of tin street, which is two and a red for a three, three legendary goblin. It's rare. It has haste. So three mana, three, three haste already good. And then, you can pay tap, uh, sorry, you can tap it and sack an artifact to put a plus one plus one counter on each goblin you control. And whenever an artifact is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you may pay red. If you do, create a one one red goblin creature token with haste. So a three mana three three haste to start with is decent. And if you then have a clue in a mana left over at some point, you can go like tap, sack the clue, then pay the red. You get a one, one goblin. It gets now gets a counter. So you get a, a two, two goblin and Krenko itself is now a four, four. Mm. And then if that goblin's still in play, when you sack the next artifact, you now have a two, two and a three, three and a five, five. So it gets out of control really quickly. And it does start out as a three mana, three, three haste with no other requirements to just get that part of the card. Yeah. That combines to, to being a pretty good card. Like this looks like, a B plus level card. And then, yeah. you know, like a blue red deck that has a bunch of artifacts, it, it can, it can definitely go up in value. Definitely. I like B plus for Krenko with room on the top there. Uh, Lamplight Phoenix is next. This is one red, red for a three, three flying Phoenix at rare. And when it dies, you may exile it and collect evidence four. if you do return it to the battlefield tapped. This card's sweet. Yeah, this card's awesome. Lamplight Phoenix is a great card to start with, like three mana, three, three flying. And then the fact that if you have sufficient cards in your graveyard, they just don't get to kill it. <laughs> like I, I can't really see a game where they're killing it multiple times. No, that it, often. it's pretty backbreaking just happening once. Yeah. Even just once, even if it was like, it loses this ability, this card would be awesome. I, I would give Lamplight Phoenix an A minus. I think Same. it's just a really strong card. Me too. Yeah. I like a minus, especially for three mana. <laughs> Next is, Krenko's Buzz Crusher, your favorite card, Luis. It's two red red for a 4-4 four, four flying trample. It's an insect thopter. It's an artifact creature, and it's rare. It does have this extra text, but as you noted before, it's, it's kind of aimed at a certain constructed thing, it seems. Um, it says, when it enters the battlefield for each player, destroy up to one non-basic land that player controls. For each land destroyed this way, its controller may search their library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle. Um, it's rare that that, that second ability will come up or, or matter much in limited, you know, you might blow up uh, a surveil land, right. And, and then they just go get a basic and you didn't really do that much, 
But everything else comes up in Limited a lot. The four mana, four, four flying trample part of Krenko's Buzz Crusher, which makes it awesome. Yeah, I mean, four mana, four, four flying trample is, is great. It is a little bad that it's an artifact. I think that's overall a downside in this it format. Is, it actually is a significant, I mean, it matters more than you'd think. Yeah, I mean, you, you just get eaten by things like Vengeful Creeper just kind of for free. You don't end up, uh, you basically don't end up getting as much upside, even though there are some upsides as there are downsides, which doesn't make it a card I wouldn't play, but it certainly makes it a little bit worse. It does. I mean, you know, there, there's a world where the stat lines like this could push you up into the B plus range. That isn't the, the world that we live in. Um, it's extra fragility does actually, for me, bump it down like into the B minus range for Krenko's Buzz Crusher. And that's yeah. where that's where I have it. Yeah, I would I would do B minus for Krenko's Buzz Crusher. It's it's just fine. Um and Sreg's Rampage. Man, I've opened this a thousand times. Three red red for a sorcery. Destroy all artifacts you don't control. Then exile the top X cards of your library. X is number of artifacts that were put in the graveyards from battlefield this turn. You may put a creature card exiled this way out of the battlefield against haste. Return it to your hand at the beginning of the next end step. Just can't play it right. It's enough. It, yeah. It's just not not a card. Um, uh, what about Incinerator of the Guilty? This is a card. So this is <laughs> four red red. I had this one at the pre-release actually. Four so red red for sweet. a six six flying trample, and whenever it hits your opponent, when it deals combat damage to a player, you can collect Evidence X, and it deals X damage to each creature and planeswalker that player controls. So six mana, six six flying trample, and if it connects, you win the game. Yes. As easy as that. that. That's all it does. This is, this is another A plus. Like it. It, it has the downside of, again, getting removed, you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe this is like an A compared to like, you know, it's like Vayne Ripper or something. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. The, sick, hitting, winning the game if you hit your opponent is such a high upside that I would, mm -hmm. I would not nudge this into the A plus category. Because okay. look, traditional like six mana, six, six flyers with upside are, are have typically been closer to A's than A pluses. But those you can sometimes... See, have that be in play for like a turn or two and still maybe win the game this you cannot win the game if this hits you like no like they, as long as they have a single card in their graveyard with a casting cost they probably kill at least some or all of your creatures yeah and the critical piece of text on this whole card is trample because you almost always will it is very difficult for them to have a board state that this doesn't get to at least do one damage to them right i mean they need six toughness of flying and or reach just to try to get in this thing's way to buy them a turn if they don't have the removal spell already. It th This is the ultimate ask a question card. It's just like, can you kill this? Yes, no, right? And if it's no, you're dead. And if, if you can kill it, then we get to keep playing. I like A to A plus for Incinerator of the Guilty. Um, that'll move us to green. Our first card is called Analyze the Pollen. It's green for a sorcery. And it says, search your library for a basic land card. But you can collect evidence eight when you cast it. And if you do, instead search your library for a creature or a land card. So now it's any land, and then they also add creatures to the mix as well. You reveal the card, put it in your hand, and then shuffle. It's a good card. I mean, it's a pretty good card. It's it's lay of the land, right? It starts by just what green search for a land, which isn't great because you need a green to cast it. So you need to have like a 10 or 11 forest mana base for this really to help fix your mana because it requires colored start. But Collect Evidence 8 is totally doable in the late game. This is a lot easier than like Delirium was if you compare this to Traverse the Olvenwald. Mm -hmm. And if you get to go get any creature out of your deck for one mana in the late game, that that's a really good land split card. So I like C for Analyze the Pollen, maybe C plus even. It's just it's just a solid card if you have the mana base. That's the main thing is like you don't want to put this in like a nine mountain eight forest deck because I think it's just too weak of a card. Y you want this to realistically be helping uh, you 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 find your secondary color when you you know when you have only green uh, and you, you don't want to like drawing it, drawing a hand and you want to be able to count it kind of as a land like you don't want to have a a. a frequently have hands that are like mountain mountain analyze the pollen because then you just have like a brick that when you do draw a forest still might not do that much right so i i do like it at like i actually think c plus for analyze the pollen just make sure you have like nine or ten green sources you know i agree um what does sharp eyed rookie do this one's awesome i had two of these at the pre-release somehow it's a one and a green for a two two vigilance 
It's a human detective at rare. And whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, if its power is greater than this or its toughness is greater than this, so it compares power to power, toughness to toughness, put a plus one, plus one counter on sharp-eyed rookie and investigate. Oof. So so if you play, if you have this in play as a two-two and you play like a two-three or a three-two or anything bigger, this becomes a three-three and you get a clue. Now you have to play anything that has a four somewhere in its power toughness mm-hmm. and so on. But like one trigger off this and you got a two mana three three plus a clue, obviously broken. Mm-hmm. Two triggers, it's just out of this world. And it even has vigilance. So uh, I wow. would give Sharp-Eyed Rookie an A. Like I, I think oh, wow. that this – I mean if your opponent plays this on turn two, how are you feeling if you can't kill it? Miserable. Definitely You feel like miserable. you're just going to lose. It takes a little bit of work because it being a 2-2 means you can't just like play this and play a disguised creature and get a trigger. Yes. But once you have this in your deck, you are looking for all sorts of three mana 2-3s or 3-3s, you know, three mana 3-2s, like all that kind of stats. And then some four power creatures, the the pompous gadabout, the three mana 4-2 is actually really good with this because it can give you that second trigger pretty easily. So really good card. Sharp-Eyed Rookie is solid. Uh, Arch Druid's Charm is next. It's green, green, green for an instant at rare. It says choose one, and you've got three choices. You can search your library for a creature or land card and reveal it. Put it onto the battlefield tapped if it's a land card. Otherwise, put it into your hand and then shuffle. Or you can put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. So an instant speed bite with a plus one, plus one counter. Or you can exile target artifact or enchantment. Man, that really covers a lot of ground. Holy smokes. Yeah, I was, you know, ready to be like, when I saw this card, well, triple green's a little too hard. But then it really kind of delivers. So it's a, I would almost consider it a build around. I would give this a build around grade because you can't get triple green, like, for free. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a significant cost. But the combination of... Go search for any creature if the game is stalled. Go search for a land and put it into play if you really need to ramp. That one's like probably the least likely mode. Mm-hmm. And just a fight card or if – or not in a fight because they don't even do fights anymore barely. It's a bite card with a plus one, plus one counter at instant speed. So like if you attack and like they have two two twos and you have two two twos and you're like put a plus one, plus one counter on my thing. Blow out. Fight your other thing. Like you just win both combats. Yeah. That's just absurd. And then I'll, it also is a disenchant just at the end of it. So I would give Archdude's Charm a build around B, but you really need to be playing heavy, heavy green. Like we're talking 11, 12 green sources, which is doable in this Yes. Point. If you can cast it, it's going to deliver at the B level or even a B plus potentially, depending on the matchup. But you have to get through the threshold of can you cast it? Because if you can't, then you can't even put it in your deck at all. Uh, next is Audience with Tristani. This is two and a green for a sorcery. It's rare. It says, create a 0-1 green plant creature token, then draw cards equal to the number of differently named creature tokens you control. I have not been impressed by audience with Tristani. Uh, You know, your baseline is seemingly okay, right? You're getting at least something that resembles board presence in the form of an 0-1 plant, and then you get your card back off of it as well. But for me, the way it's actually played out has been less impressive than that. <laughs> or what I should say is it's been exactly that impressive because that's all it's ever really done. I've never seen it pop off where you're like, oh, you know, I, I drew two cards, you know, extra. I drew three cards off my audience with Tristani. Or it just doesn't seem to happen. I always seem to have a clue token, but not, no other creature tokens laying around. Yeah, I don't think this card really works. Like this, this feels like more of a an interested constructed card, interesting constructing card yeah. than than something that you're yeah. realistically it's gonna. Just, gonna it play needs to at least game. be a one one. Like you need to get yeah. something. At if least. it was a one one, then then you'd be talking like, okay, three mana one one draw a card. This is a three mana oh one draw a card most of the time. Sometimes you draw two. So yes, I guess it's like a build around D. But honestly, I think I would just yeah, I would just not play the card. I think it's like a D or an agree, F. Agree on both. Um, what does undergrowth recon do? Uh, not much. It's one green green <laughs> for an enchantment at Mythic Rare. And it says at the beginning of your upkeep, return target land from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So it's kind of like a crucible of worlds sort of thing. But like, honestly, just uh, just just don't put this card in your deck. Yeah. Agreed. F for undergrowth recon. Next is Axbane Ferox. This is two green green for a 4-4 four, four 
beast. It's a uh, rare and it's got death touch and haste. And there's a ward cost for it. That's kind of weird. It's collect evidence four. So there's going to be times when they just can't use removal on it at all because they don't have any cards in their yard or not enough. And there's going to be times where it's, you know, th that doesn't actually change things much, right? Where if they've got a few cards in their graveyard, then collect evidence, you know, you, they may not care about that at all. But that's all fine and dandy. But we've got a four mana, four, four haste here that happens to have death touch. This thing's a slammer. Oh, yeah. This thing just just bashes. Uh x and Ferox is great. Sometimes they won't be card. able to kill it if you play it early because of the ward. It's almost always going to take two creatures in combat. And it's really good with pump spells, even more so because the ward means sometimes it's even completely safe to go for them. Yeah, like, and you know, you'll know. If they, yeah. if they don't have cards in their graveyard. So uh, I would give x and Ferox an A-. I think it's I think it's it's quite good. Uh, Definitely. But I think it's... it's I guess... I have a bit about the same as Sharp Eyed Rookie, which actually makes me want to give them both A minuses. Yes, that I like that. That that sits with uh, with mine as well. What about a uh, case of the locked hot house? <laughs> so this is uh, three in a green, and it's a case and at rare. It says you may play an additional land on each of your turns, uh, and to solve it, you have to have seven or more lands. And once it's solved. You may look at the top card of your library at any time, and you can play lands and cast creatures and enchantments from the top of your library. So this is a super ramp payoff. I don't think it's actually too, as bad as it might look, because if you play this in a land-heavy hand, you're going to get to seven fairly quickly because you get to play extra lands, right? Like mm -hmm. the play extra lands text usually runs out after about two turns. There's not that many more lands you're going to have. Especially except, when it starts on turn four. <laughs> right. Except once it's solved, that ability actually starts to kick up again where you hit mm. multiple lands and you're just stringing together everything. Uh -huh. When your opponent plays this, you basically have to uh, win the game relatively quickly or this card is going to take over the game. And that that is a good card. So I, I like B minus for case of the locked hot house. And I I really think you want to make sure you're doing a good job of affecting the board before playing this and and also not having too many non-creature slash enchantment cards in your deck. I mean, you, you you're gonna have some, but you don't want a ton. Yeah. The, this represents the late game, right? And you have to view it as such. It, this is not the turn four play that you often want to make just to, you know, just to uh, you you generally so want to be affecting the board more directly early in the game. Um, next, oh, I like this one. Hide in plain sight. This is three and a green for a sorcery at rare. Look at the top five cards of your library, cloak two of them, and put the rest in the bottom in a random order. And just as a reminder to cloak a card, put it on the battlefield face down as a 2-2 creature with ward two. Turn it face up any time for its mana cost if it's a creature card. Yeah, so... This only costs four mana. This is like a collected company that always hits. Granted, yeah. you might not hit creatures that you can flip up, but at very worst, it's four mana for two two twos with ward. Right. Like, that's awesome. I mean, this card is just an A. Like, hide in plain sight is an incredible card. I love it. Yeah. And then, you know, you can hit creatures with disguise or just regular creatures and flip them up. Uh, last green card is called the Pride of Hull Clade, which is 10 and a green. For a two fifteen, that's your stat Sounds line. Sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else going on? <laughs> love it, man. Two fifteen. Uh, yeah, it's a legendary crocodile elk turtle. I mean, this just feels like AI like spit this thing out, right? Um, it's a mythic rare. This spell costs X less to cast, where X is the total toughness of creatures you control. So all added up, so you do actually get a significant reduction at some point. It also happens to have Defender, and it has an activated ability of two blue blue. Yes, this is a green card still. Uh, until end of turn, whenever target creature you sorry target creature you control gets plus one plus zero gains. Whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw cards equal to its toughness and can attack as though it didn't have Defender. I think this card is is basically just an F. Like you, if it. If it was too green green to activate, I could kind of see it, but you'd still have to be like, well, I'm making a deck with like a ton of big toughness creatures and I'm going to try to like stall the board and then play this as the finisher. The problem is you then also have to be playing blue green for the card to work. 
because right. it doesn't really work if you don't can't pay the two blue green the two blue blue things. So odd build around for blue green. Maybe you could try to imagine a deck that gets there, but I, honestly, I think you should probably just not put this card in your deck. It feels like Chad GPT just <laughs> spat this thing out. All right, a little bit, yeah. Um, last solid uh, single color is white. And our first card is Case of the Uneaten Feast, something that Luis and I never have to deal with. Uh, this is white for a rare, and it says, whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain a life. Not that interested in that so far, but it says to solve, you've gained five or more life this turn. And then if it is solved, you can sacrifice this case, return Cards in your graveyard, excuse me, sacrifice this case, creature cards in your graveyard gain. You may cast this card from your graveyard until end of turn. But you still have to pay. Yeah, and, and it's just one turn. Yeah, so you get that one turn window. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think this card is quite bad. It's just I would, an F, I would, right? I would put it as F. It's just so hard to flip. Minor effect when it went before it flips, and still kind of a minor effect after it flips. It's just yeah. not, it's just not that good in any at any point here. Also, Luis and I just find it offensive to insinuate that a feast could go uneaten. Yeah. Um, next is assemble the players. This is one in a white for an enchantment at rare. You may look at the top card of your library anytime, and once each turn, you may cast a creature spell with power two or less from the top of your library. I, 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 I think been, this card like look, looks like it has potential, yes. but I just I think that the situations where this is good are just not going to be come up quite as often as you might like. Like yes, you you need to build a deck that has not very many creatures that aren't small creatures or disguise because you can disguise a creature off the top of your deck with this. Yes, and, but and when you do and you draw this, sometimes you draw an extra card every turn or every other turn or what have you, every couple turns. But when you don't, maybe you made your deck a little bit weaker. And even when you do, it's not like how many creatures you have to cast off this before you got a good deal? Probably two. Mm -hmm. But sometimes those creatures, like it's turn six and you have a, a, a five drop in your hand and your top card is a is a two mana two two. And you're like, well, I either waste my turn's mana or make it or spend, I have a really inefficient turn or I give up this card because next turn that won't be an option. All that makes me not want to assemble the players. Like this looks like a build around C, but I think yeah. it's closer to like a D or an F in terms of like you're just not gonna get the the value that you would in like construct it off of this. Yeah, man, you just described my arc with this card exactly, and I came to the same conclusion you did. Uh, what does Doorkeeper Thrall do? It's one in a white for uh, Thrall at rare. It's got flash and flying. It's a one-two. And it says artifacts and creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. So the, the idea is like you cast this in response to them playing an ETB creature and boom, mm. they, they don't get the – You got them. Yeah. Yeah. The problem it, is the stats aren't that impressive and th it feels a little out of place in a disguise set. Yeah, it because it doesn't stop those no. disguise things at all. So – I think doorkeeper thrall. That looks like an F to me. Like yeah, I, just, I give it a I just, D. I, I guess. I mean, it has power and toughness. Like I just don't think you're supposed to put this card in your deck. All right. Uh, what about tenth district hero? Would you put that card in your deck? This I would put in my deck. This is a one in <laughs> a white for a two three human at rare. So that's nice stats to start with. A two three is awesome in a disguise world. Yeah. You play this on two and you can just brawl with it. It has two abilities. One is one in a white collect evidence Two tenth district hero becomes a human detective that's with base power and toughness four, four and gains vigilance. So that's a nice the, level the, up. You collect a little evidence and you get promoted to detective. You become a four, four vigilance. And by the way, you said that it is very little like collect evidence Two is, is almost trivially easy. Yeah. And then it has two in a white collect evidence Four. if 10th district hero is a detective it becomes a legendary creature named Mileva the Stalwart and has base power and toughness 5-5 five, five, and it gains other creatures you control have indestructible. So the jump between 1 and 2 is a lot bigger than the jump between 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. But you still get the ability to upgrade this into a 5-5 five, five, and it makes all your cre other creatures indestructible, which means that sometimes in the middle of combat, you can threaten to upgrade this mm -hmm. and, and save your creatures. And that, and that is pretty awesome. So... 
I would give 10th District Hero uh, a B plus. It's, yeah. a, it's a great card. I would be happy to put it into any deck, really. Agreed. It's, and it's just a stats monster. It's good at every level, right? Like yeah. two drop, and then when you do level it up to 4-4. Four, four. Uh, next is Unyielding Gatekeeper. This is one and a white for an Elephant Cleric at rare. It's a 3-2. So two mana, 3-2. It does have Disguise for one and a white as well. And when it's turned face up, Exile another target non-land permanent. If you controlled it, return it to the battlefield tapped. Otherwise, its controller creates a 2-2 white and blue detective creature token. And th there's text that's not here that says, and they never get the other thing back, right? <laughs> like you you turned yeah. it into a 2-2 basically. Yeah, so it's it starts as a 2-minute 3-2, which I like. I mean, it's not as good as a 2-minute 2-3, <laughs> right? Like in, in this in these day and age. Uh, mm -hmm. And then... You, you have the ability to either save your own permanence or just downgrade one of theirs into a detective at two mana, instant speed, middle of combat. It's a great card. It just covers all your bases. I would give this one a B plus as well. Agreed. There's absolutely nothing not to like about Unyielding Gatekeeper. It kind of does it all. Um, next is Delny Streetwise Lookout, which is two and a white for a 2-2 two -two legendary human scout at Mythic. And it says creatures you control with power two or less can't be blocked by creatures with power three or greater. And if an ability of a creature you control with power two or less triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. Cards all right. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's a three minute two, two that maybe will make it a little hard for them to block at some point. And sometimes you'll get an extra trigger out of it. I think, if you if you have some good synergies in your deck, I could see playing it. Mm -hmm. Making your creatures of the power two or less unable to be blocked by three power creatures isn't that great of an ability because a no. lot of the times they'll just be blocked by two twos. Yes, in fact, none of these abilities are very are great. Uh, three mana two two is not great. Blockable things not great. Is, you know, again, and we're not saying terrible, but not amazing. And the ability triggering thing is nice, except for that, like. It, it it's a little narrow again down to just the two power creatures and they have to have triggered abilities as well. Yeah. So I, it kind I, of is, you know, three things that are all mediocre coming together to make a card that's, you know, crosses the threshold of playability, but don't get fooled by that mana symbol. Yes. It might be a mythic. It doesn't play that way. It plays like no, a C minus or something or a C. I think it's like a D like a if, D. Okay. If you, Sure. If you had some combos with it, I could see playing it, but it's just not that good. Build around C plus. Have we ever given a build around C plus before? <laughs> for, uh, to first time for everything, and yep. that sounds about right. <laughs> Next card is awesome. Uh, it's Wojek Investigator. First time somebody played this against me, I had to read it twice because I'm like, "What? Where's the bad news here for you?" Yeah, it's two and a white for a two four flying vigilance. It's an angel detective, and it is rare uh, already awesome stats in this format i mean this thing just blocks every single thing in the Maybe format for flying vigilance is just such a beating it's like. a beating it's really a beating it definitely could have been a two three and still been awesome but uh, yeah they bumped it up and then it says at the beginning of your upkeep investigate once for each opponent who has more cards in hand than you so it even still rewards you for you know kind of dumping your hand onto the battlefield yeah i mean this card's an A. Like you, you, you just get such such good value up front, and then it, it, it's not hard to 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 just curve out such that you're able to to easily get get the investigate value. Yeah, fantastic card. A for Wojek Investigator. Next is uh -oh, Aurelia's Vindicator. <laughs> I lost uh, this thing already multiple times. Me too. And every time I read it again, and I'm like, Are you serious? It's two white white. For a 4-2 angel uh, at Mythic Rare, it's got Flying, Lifelink, and Ward 2. And then it has a disguise cost of 3 and a white and X. And it says, when it's turned face up, exile up to X other target creatures from the battlefield and or creature cards from graveyards. And when Aurelius Vindicator leaves the battlefield return the exiled cards to their owner's hands. What was it? What was the angel that did this angel of serenity? Yeah. You know, that same type of vibe where you can kind of split up the, the ability here to reduce your opponent's board and, or give you a little uh, stockpile of cards for later on. 
This card's yeah, like so unbeatably if, awesome. It basically is. So like if you're if you're really far behind, you're probably going to have to flip it up for like X equals two at most, maybe three, depending on your mana, and just exile their creatures because you're just like, well, I'm all in on this thing not dying. And if it doesn't die, you win because it's got lifelink and a few hits later, you know, you're you're just smooth sailing. It's even got ward two, though. The point in the game where you flip that up, the ward two is not like the most Ciroc solid protection. What if you're if you're far ahead, you can just flip this up and exile like two creatures from your graveyard and then if they kill your lifelink flying ward two creature you get two <laughs> creatures back <laughs> so that's absurd and the middle case is the most common as things tend to go where you're like flip this up exile your two creatures out of play and then exile one or two of my creatures out of my graveyard if again depending on mana so if they kill your vindicator to get their creatures back you you get a rebate of getting your creature backs too mm -hmm. and if they can't deal with this, then they probably just lose. Like it is just for sure uh, absurd. Yeah. Um, this is an a plus. This is, this is likely going to end up being the best card in the set. Yeah. Uh, I would say that, 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 that is almost assuredly true. Uh, last white card is called no witnesses, which is two white, white for a sorcery at rare. Each player who controls the most creatures investigates, then destroy all creatures. What do you think about this one? So it's okay. The The main complaints I have is that A, Wraths aren't at their best in white in this set because I think the white decks tend to be pretty assertive. Yeah. And B, it's a Wrath that if you're casting it because you need a Wrath, probably gives them a rebate, probably gives them an extra card back. And that that really limits the upside potential of this uh, significantly. It definitely does. The extra card, you know, you've, we've seen it where there, it's a creature left behind or they draw a card or they get some material, you know, in the past we've seen different ways that this has played out. It always hurts a lot more than you'd think, you know, wraths already are walking a fairly fine line and to just, if it does hand them a card, it, it is hard to imagine a scenario where you cast it, where you're the one with the most creatures, right? That's kind of not the reason why you have a wrath in your deck. So it's almost always going to be them getting the, the uh, clue. And it really does push it into the mediocrity, even at four mana wrath, which would be really good in this format. Like I like the five mana one that we talked about, the black one, but no, when it says to me is like, like a C. Yeah, I, I would give it a C. Like it's just, I mean, I'm not saying that I wouldn't put this card in my deck if I yeah. had, if I had the option to, to do it. I just, I don't think I would take it very highly. Yeah, you're never going to see it because other people are going to think it's just a regular wrath and take it before you. Okay, that's the last of the uh, white cards and the single color cards, in fact. So let's move to gold. Our first gold card is called Officious Interrogation, which is a great name. It's uh, blue-white for an instant. It's rare. And it says, this spell costs blue-white more to cast for each target beyond the first. But as we play the game, it just costs blue-white because it actually targets players. So choose any number of target players. Uh, investigate X times where X is the total number of creatures those players control. I guess it costs either blue-white or blue-blue-white-white in our case. Right. You can go up to two on this, and then mm -hmm. you, you get uh, a total of basically yeah, one, one clue for each creature. And if you pay the full amount, one clue for each creature uh, in play, which is That's pretty good. That's actually kind of good, yeah. Um, the problem is you, you, you need to, it's good. It's always good in the same way where it's like the game is long and you're, and there's a lot of creatures in play. Mm -hmm. So, cause in, in fast games, it, it's not, it's, it's, it's bad both in terms of there's not yes. many creatures in play and you don't have time to crack the clues. Yes. So it's going all in on a certain type of game, which that makes it not that flexible, which I, I actually think is a pretty reason, reasonable drawback. Yeah, that that does hurt its overall grade for sure. Um, it's more narrow than it appears. You know, I wouldn't start off very high on officious interrogation. I mean, even in its best case scenario or even in a good case scenario, let's say it's drawing you, let's say it's getting you three clues. I mean, you still have to be the one to spend all the extra mana too. Like this is a very slow way to get cards into your hand, even when it's working. Yeah. It so, makes me you know, a lot less excited about it. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not the most into, uh, like, would you give it a D? Would you give it a C? I would give it a D. I think yeah, officious interrogation. It just seems like too much work. Like too much I, work. again, I just, I just don't like card draw spells that, uh, 
that all they do is you spend mana to draw cards. I just don't think that's a very effective way to to try to win games. Well, what if I told you you could spend a ton of mana, though? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what does Alquist Proft Master Sleuth do? Elquist Proft is a one blue white for a 3-3 three, three legendary human detective at Mythic Rare with Vigilance. And when he enters the battlefield, you investigate. So three mana, three, three, investigate. All right, we're, we're great. You can also spend X white, blue, blue, and tap and sacrifice a clue to draw X cards and gain X life. So he cast Sphinx's Revelation mm-hmm. off of your clues. Mm-hmm. Awesome card. I mean, yeah. Nothing to complain you start about by here. paying three mana for a three three vigilance that gets you a clue. So and that, then they have to kill this, or you're going to start using Sphinx's Revelation if you have the time. And you can reload with any clue from any source, which is also pretty sick. So uh, I'd give Alquist Prof to a, an A minus, like just just a great card. You know that they you, you're not going to sit there and, and use the X ability of the all that fast. But a three mana three three that makes a clue is just a good deal. It bashes past. You know, disguise creatures as vigilance or blocks as well. It just kind of does what the things you need it to do. Totally. B my B plus a minus range for Alquist prof. Next is Ezram agency chief. This is one white, white, blue, blue for a five, five flying legendary archon detective. This is a regular rare. Um, when it enters a battlefield, you investigate twice and you can pay one mana and sack any artifact. The clues of course are the main ones. And it says, Exram gains your choice of Vigilance, Lifelink, or they save the best for last, Hexproof until end of turn. This card is, is That's absurd. That's a like, stupid card. The, the difficult casting cost is really the only drawback because, it, you know, you, you have to have two planes and two islands to cast this card. But if you... If you can cast this on turn six, so you have one mana floating, you, you basically never lose the game. They have to have a way to kill this in response to the trigger. Otherwise, you then have hexproof protection up with the clues, and you can play around that by just making a clue beforehand. Right. And at that point, you've got a 5-5, you know, threatening to get hexproof. And if they don't kill it, if they don't have two ways to kill it, which they probably won't, that's pretty hard. It's a 5-5. You then just get to sit there and give it, uh, you know, vigilance if you need to or lifelink. Though those kind of overlap because, like, how much damage are you saving with vigilance versus gaining with lifelink? And, and just sit there on clues to get hexproof as well. Like this card just seems really hard to beat. Plus, worst comes to worst, you play this and then they somehow kill it. And you get to get two clues out of the deal. So you get a three for one. Yeah. So <laughs> I would give Ezra an A plus. This is the kind of card that I think is an A plus. Agreed. Uh, I've had it a couple of times and it absolutely dominates every single board that it hits. Just be careful to, if at all possible, leave that extra mana up as Luis described. Uh, next is. Uh, drag the canal, which is blue black for an instant at rare. And it says create a two, two white and blue detective creature token, which, so you're just getting a two mana, two, two at instant speed, which is pretty cool. And then it says, if a creature died this turn, you gain two life, surveil two, and then investigate. Yeah. That's a card, man. I mean, that does a lot of stuff for two freaking mana. I like it. It, it's, it. it only cares if a creature died, not yours, not theirs, just a creature. It, it's really not that hard to set this up where you get to cast it. And when you cast it with kicker effectively, you get a 2-2, two, 2-life, two, two surveil, and investigate. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely in for that. Yeah. I mean, this is a narrow card in that it's blue-black specifically. It only goes into that one deck. It's a little tricky to cast, but definitely worth your two mana. Um I would go B for drag the canal. Yeah, B B for drag the canal sound it seems reasonable. Uh, what about Lazav wearer of faces? So this is blue black for a two three uh, shapeshift shifter detective at rare, and when Lazav wearer of faces attacks, exile target card from a graveyard, then investigate. So note that you do have to have a card in a graveyard in order to do that. You got to invest something, have something to investigate, and then. Uh, Whenever you sacrifice a clue, you may have Lazav become a copy of a creature card exiled with it until end of turn. So once this starts exiling creatures, you then have a bank of creatures that it can turn into. And uh, you can you can choose the same one each time. And, you, you know, you generate more clues and all that. Um, but I would take a two mana two three that with this with the investigate text just straight up. And then, of course, uh, once you once you add the fact that it can actually transform, it's even better. So I like B plus for Lazav. Just yeah. a really good card. It's played at B level, I think, for me. Is 
is where I'd put him. Um, what about Etrada Deadly Fugitive? So Etrada is a three mana one four death touch and says whenever an assassin you control deals combat damage to opponent, cloak the top card of that player's library. So three mana one four death touch and she's an assassin, of course, a vampire assassin at Mythic. So whenever she or another assassin, there's a couple in the set, hits your opponent, you can you can cloak the top card, right? You exile it face mm-hmm. down. She also has an ability that says face down creatures you control have two blue black turn this creature face up. If you can't exile it, then you may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost, which is really what it's saying is you can always pay four mana to flip up your, your face down creatures. And if you can't turn it face up because it's not a creature, you can exile it and cast it. Mm. So if it's a spell, for example, let's say you you put, you know, shock under this, right? You you exiled shock off the off the top card of their library. You can spend four mana to try to flip it up, exile it, and cast it without paying the mana cost. So you can okay. basically cast it by paying four. Note that you shouldn't flip lands up because you can't cast lands. So lands stay face down, but every other card type you can you can flip up and either cast as the card type or or just it's the creature, so it's flipped up. That's a sweet card. Yeah, I mean, three mana, one four death touch that kind of demands blocking is is a pretty tough one. So I, I would give a B plus for Etrada. Yeah. Like, very threatening card. I like that, and it's good on defense too. Uh, next is Blood Spatter Analysis, which is black red for an enchantment at rare, and it says when it enters the battlefield, it deals three damage to target creature and opponent controls. So you got a nice little two mana deal three, and then it says whenever one or more creatures die, mill a card and put a blood stain counter on Blood Spatter Analysis, then sacrifice it if it has five or more blood stain counters on it. When you do, return target creature card from your graveyard your hand that's a nice little card yeah i mean it's a it's a two mana deal three but it it already gets a you know a a counter on the house because you're presumably killing something with it Mm -hmm. and it it doesn't care whose creatures die so when you one of your creatures dies it mills note that it's whenever one or more so in combat it's always just one mill total it's probably good for the controller of blood spatter analysis that you don't get milled for six in a big combat. Mm-hmm. And then at some point you get a rebate, you get to sack this and get a creature back, which is, which is pretty sweet on your two mana removal spell. Right. So you figure, you know, you're getting the two mana removal spell up front and then some percentage of games, you'll get a creature back into your hand as well. So you'll get a two for one out of it. That's actually a good two for one. There are many times when that won't happen. The game will end before uh, this thing ever transforms, but then you're still just playing, you know, red black sorcery deal three anyway so really nothing not to like about it i'd give a b to blood splatter analysis yeah i like b for blood splatter analysis as well Ooh, this next card's a nice one it's judith carnage connoisseur this is three black red for a three four legendary human shaman at rare and it says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery uh spell choose one um and when they say choose one, there's really only one to choose, by the way, uh, which is create a 2-2 red imp creature token with when this creature dies, it deals two damage to each opponent. You also are allowed to choose that your instant or sorcery gains death touch and lifelink if you'd like to upgrade a burn spell, um, you know, turns your shock into kill anything, gain two life, etc. But in my experience with this card, which I've actually had a decent amount, I think I've had it three or four times now, I, I've always chosen to make an imp. Yeah, it would come up if you're trying to shock a 5-5. Five, five. That's about it. There's not yeah. a whole lot of, you know, uh, other other times. Like, I guess, a, you know, you play a sweeper or something. Lifelink could be kind of good on that. A, but, a, burn, uh, a burning sweeper? I mean, that's the problem, yeah. right? Is it like almost no spells do damage? Like, almost, you know, you'll probably only have a couple spells in your whole deck. None of your combat tricks do. None of your, you know, card draw. Nothing else does. So you're just spitting out these really annoying tutus for your opponent. Yeah, so I love Judith. I I think Judith is solid. She's five mana, mm-hmm. and you then have to have spells afterwards, and she has to survive in order for you to cast those spells. Yes, there is significant setup cost which for sure. Kind of puts me into like puts her into B range for me. But yeah, that's what I but think I, too. She definitely has a, is a payoff if when she works. Yeah, and I mean you don't need much, right? Like the, you make one two two, and you're you're already quite happy with that. Yeah. I would say B for Judith is where I would come down. Yeah, I like B for Judith as well. There is a slight build around uh, element there too. Uh, Next is Rakdos, Patron of Chaos. This is four black red for a 6-6 
legendary demon at mythic rare. Rakdos has flying and trample and says at the beginning of your end step, target opponent may sacrifice two non-land non-token permanents. If they don't, you draw two cards. And that's on your end step, by the way. So yeah, that's so you immediately big, get this. Yeah. So basically, I've played against this twice now. They cast this and either way, they're getting two cards. I was going to say, how did it go? <laughs> yeah. I, well, I have not I, played I against it, Rakdos once. yet. Because oh, okay. once I just I just sacked two things on tapped killed Rakdos because I was pretty far ahead. Okay. And then the other time it wasn't close. So uh, okay. But I I would say Rakdos is honestly probably another A plus. Like if mm-hmm. if you you get a six six flying trample that if they don't kill it you're obviously going to win the game because you have a six six flying trample. But it probably drew you two cards right away. Yeah. Or or, or eight two things, and they're like real things, not not tokens, not lands. So yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking mold drifters. This is what mold drifters look like. Now. <laughs> this is a mold drifter. There you go. Um, yeah, I like A to, I mean, the high, basically A plus for Rakdos, right? Yeah, I would say A plus for Rakdos. Yeah. Uh, what about World Souls Rage? It says X red green for a sorcery at rare, and uh, it deals X damage to any target, and you can put X lands into play from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield. Uh, tapped. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I see this card, the the land part I- isn't really relevant in most scenarios. But the you know the fact that it is a ramp payoff, right? I mean, you can do a lot of damage with this thing. I don't love it as an individual removal spell. I don't love it as a ramp payoff. I don't really like the land part of it. I have won with and lost to it in decks that could create a lot of mana, basically just green based decks. So maybe it deserves its slot, but you know, it's hard to imagine that this is a card that's like you open it up and you jump out of your chair. Right. I don't even know if it's good. Like it it was fine for me. I I didn't regret having it in my deck, uh, in my red green deck. At what price points is this good? Four mana to deal to is pretty bad. Yes, it is quite bad low, but I mean, it does go upstairs. Like I've had this, you know, become a game plan where I've beaten down, flipped up a few creatures and I'm like, all right, just get him to six or whatever. Right. And then boom, world souls rage you out of the game. Um, again, eight, leveraging eight mana. extra mana. <laughs> yeah. That, 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 I've said ramp payoff. I mean, that, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. I, I did it I, multiple times. Like the card was okay. It, it played better than it, than it looked, I guess is what I would say. That said, okay, well, it looks quite bad to me. And when I'm, mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't usually associate ramp decks with getting them down to six and, and needing to close. Well, out the red, game. red green decks do that in this format. I mean, look at the cards. They beat down really hard. Yeah. I, I, no, the red green cards do beat down, mm-hmm. but then I don't know that they're, they're, I wouldn't describe them as much as ramp decks. Well, I mean, I'm just saying green based. Like I'm playing, I'm playing the, the mole, you know, that kind of stuff or just making the cut. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to go too hardcore on this card. I, it played better than I thought. I still get, I'd give it a C. (laughs) I'd give world souls rage a C to be clear. Um, I'm not ultra high on it, but it, it actually did play a little better than it looked. Okay. I, I I think I would give it a D. It could be my inclination. That's fair. Um, what does Andrag the Quake Mole do? <laughs> it's it's going to sound funny, but I had two of these at the pre-release also. Uh, what the is, heck? <laughs> yeah, very, very weird. Uh, it is a two red-green legendary mole god <laughs> at uh, Mythic Rare. Mm-hmm. It's an 8-4. And what it says is, Whenever Andrag the Quake Mole becomes blocked, untap each creature you control, and after this combat phase, there's an additional combat phase. And it has an ability of three red, red, green, green. Andrag must be blocked blocked each combat this turn if possible. Okay. So it's a kind of funny card, actually. So what happens is you spend four mana to cast this, and you attack with it. If they have two two twos or something like that, well, they can block, but if you have a trick, they just get completely demolished because oh, yeah. you go like, let's say not, I'm not even talking about the trample trick because that would obviously mm-hmm. extend the game. But let's say you just give it like, I don't know, a plus two, plus two trick or something. Mm-hmm. You then untap it and all your other creatures and get to whack them again. <laughs> yeah, that's brutal. <laughs> they also can't chump with it because if they chump with, if they chump a one, one on this, you just untap it and attack again. Okay. So maybe they take eight 
Well, that's obviously very bad for them because it's right. so much damage. Of course, they can just kill it. That is the the the, the actual option to to get rid of this thing, mm-hmm. and that is something that can that can happen. You know, like if okay if. if if they if you play your four drop and they kill it, but a four mana eight four is really good stats. It is amazing stats. That is a very high toughness, you know, for that stat line. Four mana four toughness means that it doesn't die to common burn spells very much, and you've got eight power for four mana. Like that doesn't sound real. Like I, it no. feels like it should say at the beginning of your upkeep, this thing does eight damage to you or something, and it doesn't. Like no, like. At its base, it is a four mana eight four, and it has all upside from there, no drawbacks, <laughs> none. So that's awesome. I mean, that card is really strong. Now, like you said, it can just die, and then it solves all the problems. But you know, that's a lot to ask. I mean, things you any card that says you have to kill me like now, or this game's you know gonna get out of control for you, is a card I'm interested in. Yeah, and this and this card, I think, it combines really, really well with combat tricks. Like, yeah, if if you have Anzarag in your deck, you should be looking for combat tricks because that just punishes your opponent so badly. And then at some point, you might get to seven mana and, and use it. Though I don't think that's a huge aspect of the card. But B I plus? would give, yeah, I would give it a B plus, and I would say draft yeah. some combat tricks because that's what really punishes them, especially plus B plus three and trample. Like <laughs> that's insane. That, that's, that's just, just, you're, just you're, they're just taking twenty at that point. Yeah. Um, what does Yaris Roar of the Old Gods do? It's two red green for a four four legendary centaur druid at rare. It says other creatures you control have haste. Whenever one or more face down creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, draw a card. So. It gives all your creatures haste and all your d- disguise creatures. They can trip if they hit. Well, one per combat, like you know, not one per. But mm-hmm. so, so you're like, all right. Well, if I play, if I have this in play and play a disguise creature and attack, my opponent's obviously going to block it because they don't want you to draw a card. But the last ability is also really messed up. Whenever a face down creature you control dies, return it to the battlefield face down, uh, and then turn it face up. So, so it dies presumably trading for some material on the other side and then you upgrade it on the way back. <laughs> like, yep. That's, that's exactly just, what happens. That's just stupid. Yaris is sweet. Yeah. Yar- Yaris is, is, is very good. I've, I've lost badly to this card where it's just like, it's kind of, if you can't kill Yaris, it's kind of damned if you do damned, if you don't, cause like, all right, they're sending in a disguise creature and you know, you have a two, two. It's like, well, okay, I guess I'll take it and you draw a card. That sounds pretty bad. Well, but if I trade or even if I block with like a 3-3, you might just be flipping a Blitz Hellion or a Vine Creeper or something that just costs totally. a ton of mana. Totally. So I, I would give Yaris – I wouldn't even say build around because red green – No. It's so easy to have a ton of disguised creatures. I would just give Yaris an A-. minus. Like it's just it's yeah. just a good card in, in red green. Agreed. And also other creatures you control have haste is just static. Like it doesn't care about face down. It's just your next play in red green is going to have haste. And this thing's already a 4-4. Like, that's overwhelming in and of itself. Next is uh, Tristani Three Whispers. And this costs white, green, and then either another white or another green. And uh, so three mana total for a 4-4 legendary creature Dryad. This one's mythic rare. And this one has three different activated abilities. The first one is one and a green. Target creature gains death touch until end of turn. The next one is green or white. Target creature gains vigilance until end of turn. And the last one, and this is the nasty one, is two and a white. Target creature gains double strike until end of turn. And this can target itself, of course. Totally. This card's a beast. You you have to be playing white green because the hybrid is kind of just makes it easier in white green to play, but it does require white and green. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to cast 4 4, but in in straight two color white green, it's basically green white colorless to cast this. Yeah. You you get a gimme on the third one. Mm -hmm. So three mana 4 4 that can gain double strike for three mana and the other abilities, but those are are not that relevant. Right. I mean, that, that is awesome. Like that, it just, you play this and it's just really, it's, it puts this really hard effect on your opponent to deal with on any creature you have, especially for five mana, death touch and double strike just means, well, you you can't beat it in combat. Like 
a two two with death touch and double strike is basically impossible to kill in combat. Mm-hmm. You would need to to block it with four creatures to trade, <laughs> <laughs> or I guess three creatures will trade. Three two twos would trade with it. That doesn't it doesn't sound good. I mean, you, and of course, a four four is basically just you know impossible. Yes. So. If you're green white, this card's awesome, and uh, it's just a huge beater. So I would give an A minus to Tristani. Yeah, I would. I'd probably just give it an A for just because yeah. it's a three mana four four. Like it's already such a pain to deal with. Um. Yeah, Tristani's awesome. Next is Tulsimir Midnight's Light. This is two green white white for a three two elf scout. It's a legend and it's rare. It also has lifelink. So five mana three two lifelink, but. Doesn't come to the party alone. When Tulsimir Midnight's Light enters the battlefield, create Voya Fenstalker, a legendary 5-5 five, five green and white wolf creature token with trample. Whenever a wolf you control attacks, if Tulsimir attacked this combat, target creature an opponent controls blocks that wolf this combat if able. That's a dummy. Yeah, I mean, five mana for a 3-2 lifelink plus a 5-5 five, five trample. And it even gets the ability to, like, force uh, your one of their opponents to, or one of their creatures to block your wolf. Like, yeah, Tulsimir is an, probably an A-plus, to be honest. Probably like, an A-plus. There's just no way to really escape this card without getting uh, significantly beaten down in card advantage. Agreed. And this fills that role that we were talking about before about, you know, can you die after you cast this? And it's really difficult, too. So... A plus for Tulsimir Midnight's Light. Next is Relive the Past. This is five green white for a sorcery at rare. And it says return up to one target artifact card, up to one target land card, and up to one target non-aura enchantment card from your graveyard to the battlefield. They are five, five elemental creatures in addition to their other types. Is this something that I can make happen at all? I don't really think so. I don't think so either. It's just too much work. So I would give an F to this. If you can yeah. figure out a way to make it work, that's cool. But I just don't think that's going to happen very easily. Agreed. Next is Tesa Opulent Oligarch. This is one black white for a 2-3 legendary human advisor at rare. It has death touch. And it says at the beginning of your end step, investigate for each opponent who lost life this turn. And whenever a clue you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, Create a 1-1 one, one white and black uh, spirit creature token with flying, and the ability only triggers once each turn. It's it, decent. The way, this, the way this is worded, they don't know. They don't, you don't have to play this before you attack. So when you oh. get to you, you get to like attack, and maybe they would have blocked, maybe not. They decide not to, and then you go play this, say go, and you get, and you get a clue immediately. And then once Stick you get a clue, it. you can then start – uh, cracking those clues, get spirits. And then once you get a, a single spirit, you probably are going to get to hit and, and, and trigger. And this just gets out of control just really quickly. Well, also just being a three mana, two, three death touch. This, this is another is a sweet. <laughs> it's an a for just, sure. It's just an unbelievably good card. <laughs> what does treacherous greed do? <laughs> this is a funny one. This is one white black and in, it's an instant at rare. And it, it says, as an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice a creature that dealt damage this turn. <laughs> so that doesn't mean damage to a player. It could be damage to a creature or player. But it has to have dealt damage and it has to have survived. Yeah. Because if your 2-2 two, two blocks theirs, you know, it doesn't live to – it's never alive at a spot where you can cast Treacherous Greed. But the upside, this says draw three cards, your opponent loses three life, and you gain three life. That's a, the The – Main text is so insane, right? Three mana, drain them for three, draw three is like so great. But <laughs> they really did make it difficult, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is you know, textbook like too high of a setup cost. Where, it is. Look, if you, can, if you can pull this off, it is very good. But I just don't think you're going to pull it off very often. And I don't really think you should try to, to do so. I, I would probably play it in like a, a white black deck that had like a ton of little creatures where maybe you're like attack with two unscrupulous agents, like the ravenous rats, they block one, one gets through and then you sack it to do, to gain three, draw mm-hmm. three and then lose three. But most of the time, I think you just shouldn't put this card in your deck. Unfortunately. That's what I think too. I mean, it's also a proven formula for losing, you know, is spending three or more mana to sacrifice actual onboard presence, especially one that when you imagine it, 
any creature that has dealt damage this turn is either evasive enough to keep getting through or was bigger than whatever chump locked it and is probably not something that you'd prefer to sacrifice. So as much as um, I like the upside on Treacherous Greed, I would I would give it like a D, like a, just because there is some upside to it. Uh, so I wouldn't give it an F, but I, I would give it a D. Yeah, I would give it a D as well. Uh, what about Kaya Spirits Justice? This is a Planeswalker. It's two white black for a Kaya Planeswalker at Mythic Rare. And so first she's got a static, which is whenever one or more creatures you control and or creature cards in your graveyard are put into exile, you may choose a creature card from among them. Until end of turn, target creature you control, target token you control becomes a copy of it, except it has flying. God. So that's I, seriously I, just the static. Bit. That's five lines of text. Yeah. Which, Come uh, on. Yeah, anyways, the plus two is surveil two, then exile a card from a graveyard. The plus one is create a one, one white and black spirit creature token with flying. And Ooh, the minus the two is exile target creature you control for each other player, exile up to one target creature that player controls. And she starts at three loyalty. So that's pretty nice. So you spend, I mean, three loyalty, four mana Planeswalker that has a plus one of make a, a one one flyer. I would always put that card in my deck. Yeah, like, for sure. That 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 card is just a playable card, just straight up, because you can just play this, tick up to four, have a one one flyer, could block anything. If they don't kill it, you get another one, and then you probably get to cast a spell out of your hand, and then all of a sudden the game is just out of control. It also has the ability because of that passive. When you, when you plus two, you surveil, then exile a creature, and one of your tokens becomes a copy of that creature's on a turn. And you can minus two and sack a token, kind of like Grist, to, or sack any creature, really, to, to exile one of their creatures, and then also copy it onto one of your tokens until end of turn if it has like a cool attack trigger or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I would give Kaya Spirits Justice an A-. minus. Like yeah. if, if your opponent casts this on curve, you're, you're going to lose unless you can kill it right away. Definitely. Like making a plus one, just, just straight up the plus one, make a flyer every turn is is just really, really hard to hard to defeat. Yeah, and the fact that the minus two is a removal effect of sorts and leaves you with loyalty left over to start making one ones is amazing. Uh, next is Kylox's Volt Strider. This is one blue red for a four four vehicle. It's mythic. Um, it has a crew cost of two, but you can also collect evidence six to effectively crew it. It turns it into an artifact creature until end of turn. And it says, when Kylox's Volt Strider attacks, you may cast an instant or sorcery spell from among the exiled cards with it. If that spell would be put into a graveyard, put it onto the bottom of its owner's library instead. Annoyingly, you do have to pay. <clears throat> yeah, you, you, you do. But uh, I actually think this card is a, it's a, certainly a build around. You can't just put this in your deck. But mm. this is like a build around A. Mm -hmm. Like, if you have a bunch of removal spells, you know, or or even like bounce and tap spells, right? Just going like, all right, I'm going to collect evidence uh, six. I'm going to make this a four four attack, cast that spell, and uh, you know it goes on the bottom. Obviously, you can't just keep doing it over and over again. But you just end up in a spot where like you're getting two for ones off all your spells while getting to attack with a four four, and just getting to to cast things over and over again. Like, yeah, I, I think that I think that works out pretty well. You also could just do worse than a three mana four four vehicle with crew two. Like crew two is the sweet spot and four four is nice sizing. So Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean get, well, you want to give it gotta be right for this. Definitely. Yeah. I've I've built around and played it and it was pretty darn good. Uh next is a weird one. It's ill timed explosion. This is two blue red for a sorcery at rare. Aren't most <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh draw two cards. So you can just have it be, by the way, that's it. Uh, there's a May coming up here. So you could just have it be two blue red sorcery, draw two cards, which is really quite bad, right? Yeah. I, you Four can't mana put draw that card in your deck anymore. Right. So this is where it gets interesting because it says, then you may discard two cards. So you draw two and then you take two from your hand. So you're not actually up any cards at all. And it says, when you do... Ill-timed explosion deals X damage to each creature where X is the greatest mana value among cards discarded this way. So it's really interesting because it gives you this ability to have a four mana sweeper, but 
it looks like you're like, oh, and you get some card draw and stuff like that. You really only get card selection and yeah. you, you have to spend four mana and your own card to do this. So that's not good. And then on top of it, you have to actually discard something like a spell, like a legit, you know, expensive spell that you probably would really like to keep in your hand in order to sweep the board. Now you're down quite a lot of material there. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you are, you're trying to use this card and you probably have to discard the cards to it most of the time though. One of the cool things about the way this card works is Mm -hmm. yes, you can't put four mana divinations in your deck, Mm -hmm. but What's good about this is it's a sweeper when you need it to. And if you don't need a sweeper, sometimes a four mana divination is fine. Yeah. It's it's you're getting subsidized by the fact that you're able to uh play a put a card in your deck that justifies itself, while sometimes you do actually get to play it as the divination part, yeah. which I think is pretty neat. Now, the cool part about it though is that, you know, we talked about the there's two other rafts that we've already talked about during this review. Black Wrath costs five. The white one costs four, but oftentimes will give your opponent a card. But Ill Time Explosion is just four mana. Very, very often sweep the board. Well, not even just sweep the board. You can also discard like a land and a cheap card to deal two to everything, keeping your maybe yeah. your three three alive and killing their three two twos or whatever. Like right. you know, you, it gets to be modular here. Yeah. So uh, I, I would say ill timed explosion looks pretty good to me. This actually looks like a B plus to me. It's like, it's weird. It doesn't look good to me, but it plays well. Like I've had this yeah. numerous times, and it plays like a B B plus. I mean, I also really like it in like a blue red deck that's spending a lot of times, you know, casting deduces and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you start to get, you start to like get behind on board as you're casting card draw. And then all of a sudden that you just cast this and then boom, blow up their stuff. Bonus points. If your Grixis deck can uh, discard the, the three, one that gets, but comes back from your graveyard when you get a clue, (laughs) the the zombie. Oh yeah. (laughs) That, that, that's a pretty good one. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I think overall, uh, ill-timed explosion looks like a really good card, and I think it plays really sweet. Yeah, uh, I'd say BB plus for ill-timed explosion. Um, next is Kylox Visionary Inventor. This is five blue red for a four four legendary Viachino artificer at rare. It has menace, ward two, and haste, but it is a seven mana four four, um, and it says whenever Kylox. Uh, attacks sacrifice any number of other creatures then exile the top x cards of your library where x is their total power you may cast any number of instant and or sorcery spells from among the exile cards without paying their mana costs it's uh, seven mana man it's is, is seven freaking mana like what do we, how am i it, it's also this weird combination right of like Exile these cards and it's like, okay, well, I'm going to build around this and have a ton of, you know, instant and sorcery cards in my deck. But it's like, well, let's just check creatures. Like, what? Yeah. Right? So like, why is it checking for creatures if I'm being incentivized to put instants and sorceries in my deck? It's a weird, weird thing. Yeah. I think, I think Kylox overall is too much, uh, too many different pieces to make work. Like it's asking for lots of creatures. It's asking for lots of spells, but also costs seven. So you need to get seven lands into play, which yeah, no. No, the no, net no. of all this is an F. It's an F. just, just, a, I don't think you should try for it. Uh, Assassin's trophy is back. This is green black for an instant at rare. It says destroy target permanent and opponent controls and its controller may search their library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield and then shuffle. I don't actually like this card that much. I think it's a little bit too too much card disadvantage. Mm-hmm. In if the format was really fast, the drawback would be a little bit lessened because just killing something is a lot more important, and they there's you know they might not be able to use the mana quite as effectively. I'd feel like this format's not fast enough, and there's enough mana sinks, especially with all these clues and all the things like yep. that. Yep. That when you assassin's trophy, you, you you're just getting two for one, and that even if it's a la- even if they got a land out of the deal, not like a spell, a land still is a card. And and that yes. does add up and you're not ending the game long enough where if they tap that land four times before the game ends, like it's a pretty big drawback to, to this card. So it it's is. not like removals at its high point anyway, like just play a different removal spell. Don't play this one. So I, I would give Assassin's Trophy a D it's, yep. 
it's an okay sideboard card if you're you know if you're playing against someone who's got like the the incinerator right the six six flying trample and it's like well i can't beat that card so i guess i guess i've got a yeah board an assassin's trophy but i would default to not playing this card agreed uh next is urgent necrop how do you how do you say that necropsy necropsy uh two green black for an instant at mythic and it says at an additional cost to cast this spell collect evidence x where x is the total mana value of the permanence this spell targets destroy up to one target artifact up to one target creature up to one target enchantment and up to one target planeswalker so much like bargain i feel like collect evidence has been pretty easy to pull off i agree so when i look at this i think well which two things can i get to right. end up killing mostly like an enchantment and a creature i would say mm-hmm. like you're not obviously killing planeswalkers all that often sometimes you pick off a clue for free because it's it doesn't actually require any additional evidence to kill a clue <laughs> oh yeah okay that's nice it's it's always just a free roll note that you do have to get x to exactly equal the mana cost so that can be a little tricky it you, has can't to be, overpay. It's, you can't overpay Mm-mm. oh weird yeah so you normally this one, can yeah that sucks this one takes a little bit of work, but I just haven't found that to be so so difficult. And by the time you want to do this, uh, you often have enough cards in your graveyard that you should be able to kind of modularize it to where you need it to be. So yeah. I actually like B for Urgent Necropsy. I, I think it's just a good card. I do too. I, I, I feel like you're getting a two for one effectively every time out of this. And it has the upside of, of occasionally being a three for one or more. Uh, next is Izoni. Uh, center of the web this is four green black for a five four legendary elf detective at rare it's got menace and it says whenever izoni center of the web enters the battlefield or attacks you may collect evidence four if you do create two two one black and green spider creature tokens with menace and reach and you can sacrifice four tokens to surveil two then draw two cards and gain two life. This card's stupid. I had it twice, and it was just absurd both times. Oh, yeah. It's the biggest beating in the world. Yeah. It's an easy A, um, mainly because they made the ability trigger on ETB as well as attack. The ETB triggers enough. The the spider tokens are unbelievably good. They're Menace two ones. Reach? They have the <laughs> things that you want, right? They have really good evasion for attacking and they have reach for when you're behind and they have two power. So they trade or at least threaten to trade off with, um, you know, disguised creatures. Th- th- this thing is stupid. And then uh, of course they just tack on a bunch of extra goodies like menace onto itself and uh, the sacrifice for tokens. But that doesn't come up very often either, just because generally speaking, the tokens that you have are going to be these spiders and they're really valuable. You know, I mean, they're worth a card almost. So, yeah, I, I would say Azoni is actually an A+. Plus yeah, cause I agree. You, 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 just, you just play this and you get two two ones. Even if this dies, you end up with those two, two absurd two ones. <laughs> and then you also have the ability to maybe rebuy, like – crazy just just keep going like it's a it's an absurd card so yeah. it's also super easy easy to splash so if you if you see this card mm. you should basically just take it yep so a plus for izoni center of the web that card's amazing next is war leaders call which is one red white for an enchantment oh this card and it's rare and it says creatures you control get plus one plus one and whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control war leaders call deals one damage to each opponent this card's a thumper. Yeah. Very strong card in, you know, the best archetype. Like, uh, I, I think that uh, War Leader's Call is just is just a great card. Like, you should if you see this early, you're, you 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 you're gonna want to take it and just put as many creatures in your deck as many dog walkers as you can get. It's busted with dog yes. walker. I would give War Leader's Call an A. Like, yeah, t- to like me, a. every time I've seen this card hit the battlefield, it's had a massive effect on the game. Um, what about? Agris Kos, Spirit of Justice. So this is a two red white for a two four legendary spirit detective at Mythic with double strike and vigilance. So four mana, two four, double strike vigilance. 
Whenever our aggress costs uh, enters the battlefield or attacks, choose up to one target creature. If it's suspected, exile it. Otherwise, suspect it. So <laughs> assuming nothing has gone on, you go like, play this, suspect your creature. Next turn, attack, exile your creature. And that's it. And you're getting and, this on a double strike vigilance 2-4 for 4? Four. Yeah. Come so, on. yeah, I mean, the, the, the card is just completely ridiculous. Um, you also have the ability to go play this, suspect my creature attack, and then next turn don't choose that creature, obviously. <laughs> this, this is kind so, of ridiculous. It, it, is, it is a truly ridiculous card. Uh, there's really no drawback to this. It's got great stats, and if they don't kill it, it just starts eating their creatures. It's another A+. Plus. I mean, the, yes. some of the cards in the set are just ridiculous. I mean, these cards are absolutely ludicrous. An A+, plus for Agris cost. Next is Aurelia. Uh, the law above. This is three red white for a four four angel at rare. She's got flying, vigilance, and haste. And whenever a player attacks with three or more creatures, you draw a card. That's usually going to be you. And then whenever a player attacks but with. But it does trigger off them. It does trigger off them. Whenever a trigger attacks with five or more creatures, Aurelia the Law above deals three damage to each of your opponents and you gain three life. Yeah. <laughs> Man, they are not messing around, dude. Like these rares are really, really strong. Yeah. I mean, Aurelia, Aurelia is another A+. Plus. Five mana, four, four, flying vigilance haste, poof, whack them with a Sarah Angel. And then if you had two other creatures out, you also get to attack with those and draw a card. And the attack with five thing is not completely irrelevant either. It's it not like not. a complete, you know, that's not like a complete gimme or anything. No. Like, it, or rather, it's not like something that will never happen. Like, you you will end up getting 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 to use that. Especially because that can be the difference between winning the game and not, right? Th there's scenarios where you're attacking with Aurelia in the air and your opponent's at seven. And you're like, attack with all five of my creatures. I don't care if the other four die in combat. You're taking four from this and three from this as well. So you're dead. AA plus for Aurelia, the law above. Next is Doppelgang. This is blue, green, X, X, X. It's a sorcery. It's rare. And it says for each of X target permanents, create X tokens that are copies of that permanent. So for five mana, you go blue, green, and X equals one, right? So the yeah. minimum you can cast this is five. You copy one thing. So it's just a copy of whatever the best permanent is on the board. There's yours. That's already like pretty good. Not great, but yeah. good. Like in general, mm -hmm. you we old school clones that can copy either side have have almost always been good. Yeah. Like agree. Because it just means if they have a better creature, you get to at least have parity. And then though, the next jump is eight when you cast X equals two. At X equals two, you're not getting four things. You're getting two copies of the, of the best thing and two copies of the second best thing. <clears throat> okay, that's insane. And if you go to 11, you get nine. So this card might look like it's too expensive, but I think, actually think it's a huge bomb. And the reason is you start out at the five mana kind of emergency case. You don't want to do that. If you're ide in an ideal world, you, n you never cast Doppelgang at five because you're just – you do anything else but that because at eight mana, it wins you the game. And at 11 mana, it really wins you the game. But really mm -hmm. at eight mana, it just wins the game. Mm -hmm. Like getting two copies of the two best permanents is off – it's really rare that that's not going to gonna close things out. Mm -hmm. So you have an eight mana spell that says I win the game. And we've seen eight mana I win the game spells and they tend to be good you know, if they actually win you the game, which this does – but this also has the buyout clause of just, all right, I guess I have to play this for five mana and just copy your, you know, your five, five. And, th and that escape hatch takes this from being like a card I would still be interested in and it's splashable and all that to a card I'm re I really want. And yeah, I think, I think doppelgang is an A. Like I think yeah, it's just the combination of those two things is awesome. That's incredible. Yeah. Good floor. Great upside. Next is Kellen Inquisitive Prodigy. This is two blue green for a three, four flying vigilance, legendary human fairy detective at rare. And it says whenever Kellen uh, attacks, destroy up to one target artifact. If you control that permanent, draw a card. So, you know, one way to think about this would be that it makes your clues free, you know, that clue free. You don't have to pay the two mana to get the card out of it. This also has an adventure cost though. It's a sorcery called tail the suspect and it is blue green. And it says, investigate 
you may play an additional land this turn. Which is really interesting because it, it reminds you of other cards like Explore and um, Growth, what Spiral, what was that called? Growth Spiral? Whatever. Yeah. And it reminds you of those, but it's really not those, right? Because Investigate is not draw a card. Um, but still, you're just getting this tacked on to what is already an impressive creature. A 3-4 Flying Vigilance for 4 is nice, and it even can start you know, blowing up artifacts or getting you cheaper clues or whatever. There's nothing to not like about this, right? I mean, everything comes together to be just a good, well, a great card. Yeah. No, I think I think Kellen's awesome. Uh, would always be happy to play this card in blue green. And yeah, you know, in fact, it, it, it's not a card I'm like super interested in splashing. Though you can, it's not like crazy too. The problem is you 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 lose out on the tail of the suspect mm-hmm. aspect a bit when you're splashing. But in a straight blue green deck, like just turn two tail of suspect, turn three Kellen is just you're rolling. So I I, I would give Kellen an A minus. I would too, dude. We, we're starting to tread into Prince territory here. Oh, yeah. Like oh, we yeah. have had a lot of A's. This is the most we've given out in a long time. Uh, next is Vanifar Evolved Enigma. This is two blue green for a three, four legendary elf ooze wizard. It's mythic rare. At the beginning of combat on your turn, choose one. Cloak a card from your hand. Again, that's put it face down. Uh, or put a plus one, plus one counter on each colorless creature you control. So... Dang, man, to, that's another sweet card. Like, what oh, the heck? Absurd card. Like, getting to cloak a card from your hand isn't card advantage exactly, but it does let you start to cloak lands or useless spells. Or at the very least, it's like adding three mana because you get mm-hmm. to cloak uh, one of your other like actual creatures uh, instead of paying the disguise cost. And then once you've cloaked a couple things, you just get to decide, all right, well, I'm actually just going to give distribute two or three plus one plus one counters. Like, there's just no... Like, it feels like know, once but, you get to two... Right? Like, because it's at the beginning of combat. So, like, you play this, you cloak a card. The next turn, it wouldn't be crazy to just be like, tap three mana, play a disguise card, and then put two plus, you know, distribute counters. I mean, you've got six, six on the, you know, already, plus the three, four from Vanifar. I, I, this card's just awesome. Yeah. Extremely good. I would give it an uh, A. I mean, I would give Vanifar an A as well. Wow, another one. All right. This next one's not going to get an A, right? Leyline of the Guild Pact? No, no. I, I had some good yeah, this, times with it this weekend. This is weekend, your boy. Yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, it costs four hybrid mana to cast. It's blue, green plus every color. So green, white, green, blue, green, black, green, red. It's an enchantment at rare. And if it's in your opening hand, you can start the game with it in play. All your lands are all land types. All your creatures are all colors. Uh, don't, don't, or all, Actually, all your non-land permanents even are all colors. Don't, don't play this card. It's an F. It doesn't it's just do anything. An F. It doesn't do anything in this set. Um, last gold card is Niv-Mizzet Guild Pact. And this cost Wooburg, one of each color. It's a 6-6 six, six flying, and it has hexproof from multicolored. It's a legendary dragon avatar. It's actually just a regular rare. And it says, when whenever Niv-Mizzet Guild Pact deals combat damage to a player, it deals X damage to any target, Target player draws X cards and you gain X life where X is the number of different color pairs among permanents you control that are exactly two colors. I've actually played this a couple of times. Yeah, there, there, there is some, some five color fixing for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of fixing. I have not found the deck to be worth it. Like, I think you're much better off just sticking to a traditional two-color build. But, you know, I've been experimenting, you know, early in the format. I like to push the boundaries. And I've had to miss it on the board a few times. It's okay. Um, The set isn't super well set up to give the payoff of having multiple different strictly two-color cards. There are a few. It's, you know, you get into the uncommon range and you can find them. But it's not like they're everywhere in this set. So that isn't huge you really do kind of want to be in the market for a five mana six six flying hexproof from multicolored and as it turns out you know all the good common removal beats it and it's not gold uh you know the the removal so yeah this thing does just kind of end up dying a lot the hexproof from multicolored doesn't really save it very often and therefore you know given the intense setup cost it ends up being not a very good card 
Yeah, this looks like a kind of build around C where like yeah. if if you if you can free roll the mana somehow, like if you're if you're a spot in a spot where like you actually can get the mana right on this, yeah. It, you'd, you'd put it in your deck, but it's not really worth stretching super hard. It is not. And I agree with you. It's a build around C or C plus. It's a totally fine payoff for the five color deck. It's just, you know, not, not going to just like snap when you the game. And when you see that mana cost, you kind of hope that it would just win you the game. But like we just went over, you know, five rares in a row or something, you know, that I would take over it. In fact, is it six? It was six and seven. Wow. Dude, do you realize from urgent necropsy to Vanifar was like, did we give ne Necropsy an A? No, that was a B. So it's, okay, it's, so it's Izoni. Seven, rare, seven rares in a row that got A's. That's incredible. Um, last, uh, or our only artifact, just straight up artifact is Cryptex, which is two mana for an artifact. It's rare. You tap it and collect evidence three to add one mana of any color and then put an unlock counter on it. And then you can sacrifice it to surveil three, then draw three cards, which is obviously amazing, except for that you can only do it if Cryptex has five or more unlock counters on it. Yeah. It's, I've it's, tried this thing and it just sucks. No, the problem is a mana rock that doesn't work as a mana rock is yes. just not a playable card. So this is enough. Exactly. Yep. That you summed it up beautifully. Okay. There is a cycle of 10 lands in the set, uh, one for each color pair, and they are the surveil lands. Uh, I'll read meticulous archive as our example, but there's one for each pair. Uh, they enter the battlefield tapped. They count as like in this case, a plains and an Island. It taps to add blue or white, as you might imagine. And when it enters the battlefield, you surveil one. These things are freaking nice. Oh yeah. They're great for modern too. Oh, I bet. Oh, wow. I did not think about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, man, these things have been performing for me. I've been taking them at about the C plus to B minus level as far as yeah, like comparing that, them in the picks. And I have not regretted that. Yeah, no, that, that, that sounds about right. I think. Yeah. These are better than just regular duels that, you know, we get in limited. These are rare and they're really, really nice. So yeah, I, I would take them over, you know, French playables all day long. And I don't think he'll be unhappy. The surveil one's really powerful. And of course, mana fixing is nice too. The fact that there are um, basic land types on there isn't relevant for, for us. I don't think I haven't found a case where it is, but not, not really. I don't, uh, well, no, no, it, uh, there's the, uh, the zero zero that counts number of fours to have in play. Wow. <laughs> See, this is why you're the goat Louise. Like, well, I actually had that come up with me. That's incredible. I had it in a red green deck and it, it was good. Okay, so that that's it for the regular set, um, but we do have the list, you know, the mm -hmm. extra set of cards. Now, Luis, you're okay if we go a little faster through these? Oh, yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll kind of cruise through it. Remember, these are all reprints, and we're going to focus on the ones that we think are relevant because there's many of them that aren't. So the first one is Burden of Guilt. It's white for an enchantment aura, and it says enchant creature, and you can pay one mana to tap the enchanted creature. It's a pacifism effect that requires continuous mana payment, which is about as bad as I could imagine. Like I, right. I would, I, I, I highly advise you to not play this card. I've had a number of people play it against me. It's me been too. horrendous. I'm always like excited about it. it. It's, it's like a payday loan, right? It's like you, you get what you want a little sooner because it's only yeah. one mana versus two, but then you have to pay every single turn for the rest of the game. Next is, uh, do you want to grade these? I guess we should. Yeah, I mean, Burden of Guilt, I, I think, is an F. It's like, an F. It's just if you're really hard-pressed as, a, again, a way to stop, like, one big thing they have that you, can, you can't beat, that's, I guess, a different story. But, yeah, mm -hmm. I would not I would not play that card. Uh, Leon and Relic Warder is white-white for a 2-2. Two, two. And when it ETBs, uh, you may exile target artifact or enchantment. And then if this thing leaves the battlefield, then they get it back. Yeah, that, this, this card is fine if you have double white. Yeah. It's a little hard to cast, but it's, it's going to have a useful ability most of the time that you do. Yeah. So I, I would give it a C, mostly because the casting cost is kind of difficult. Uh, spell Snare is blue. It's an instant, and it counters a spell with converted mana cost two. Exactly two. Uh, mm -hmm. I do not like this card much. I just think you're you're not going to play against – you're going to play against people who don't have enough ways to make it uh, – 
something that you can put on the stack. Like you're just going to miss too often. Definitely. It's too narrow for this format as well. That is clearly based around mana cost three, right? Like that's the inflection point. Um, I would give it, I guess you could sideboard it in against some like aggro deck or something. I don't even know. Yeah. If, if they've shown you like five or six, two drops. Yeah. Bring it in. Then then bring it in. Otherwise I don't think I would play the card. Then you've got your sideboard C all lined up and ready to go. Oh yeah. Then 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 you're, you're you're all ready for the sideboard C. (laughs) Death cloud is, uh, is black, black, black X and it's a sorcery. And it says each player loses X life then discards X cards from his or her hand, then sacrifices X creatures, then sacrifices X lands. <laughs> yeah, this is a funny one. It's it's actually a stronger card than you might think. I I, I played a lot of decks around this back in Mirrodin where it came out. Mm-hmm. And when you cast a death cloud for like three or four, it puts your opponent to like, and both players, to like no cards in hand, no creatures in play, and not very many lands in play. Like think, about, think about casting it for X equals three. You can assume it's going to wipe both hands at that point. It's Mm -hmm. very unlikely it doesn't. It takes you probably down to three lands, no creatures in play. And it takes your opponent probably down to three or four lands, maybe two lands if they're unlucky, uh, and probably no or maybe one max creature in play. So it kind of resets everything. And and you might be wondering like, okay, well, how do you – how do you break the symmetry? Well, mm-hmm. in Mirrodin, it was actually pretty easy, which is why I liked it. You just played a bunch of artifacts that mm-hmm. didn't die to this. Here, you can kind of do similar where if you can stack up, play a bunch of clue making cards and then do this, you could mm-hmm. basically make it. So you're down a card on Death Cloud, right? Because you you cast the Death Cloud. But you can, be, you can end up being uh, up cards if they lose a bunch of creatures and you don't. If... If overall they're losing more stuff than you, then you can actually get get value overall with by casting Death Cloud. And the tricky part is I don't really know where you're storing all this value that's not in yeah. creatures or cards in hand. That's a problem I have too. I haven't seen that yet. I mean, would you actually do this in a competitive if could, event? <clears throat> if you could find a way to, to to solve the problem, which I stated, which is maybe it's maybe cards with clues, maybe, you know, non-creature like permanence the you know like something like cases actually i guess or or a way to do that okay so So, you've narrowed this down to like an extremely small sliver of potential right yeah that the power level is there Mm -hmm. but yes the potential does require a lot of things to go right so I would say Death Cloud's a build around B, but really, you're probably going to go through this whole format not really having a deck that's eligible to do that. And I'm not, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're not supposed to like first or second fifth that pick Death Cloud and build towards it. Right. Uh, next is Maverick Thopterist. This is three blue red for a 2 2 human artificer. When it ETBs, you get two 1 1 Thopters with flying their uh, artifact creature tokens. And it even has improvise. Your artifacts can help cast this spell. Each artifact you tap after you're done activating mana abilities pays for one. So you can tap your artifacts to pay for one. I mean, this card's actually just insanely good. Oh, yeah. It's incredible. I mean, it's uh, five mana for a 2-2 plus two 1-1 flyers is great. And the fact that you can tap your clues to help pay for it is just absurd. Like this card... This card is very, very good. I, I would give Maverick Doctor an A minus, honestly. Yeah, it's it's it is in that range, and it fits perfectly into the deck uh, here as well. Next is Jace Wielder of Mysteries. It's one blue, blue, blue. So three blue mana for a four loyalty Jace. Uh, it says if you draw a card where your library has no cards in it, you win the game instead. Plus one target player puts top two cards of their li- sorry plus one target player mills two cards, draw a card, and then it has a. Uh, ultimate of minus eight, draw seven cards. Then if your library has no cards in it, you win the game. Jace is good, but I mean, triple blue is a little tough. Triple blue is tough, but I mean, Jace is just this like a pretty meaty planeswalker in terms of loyalty and draws you a bunch of cards. And then you also, you kind of have the sub game of like, when you play Jace and you're deciding you're going to tick it up, it's the only thing it can do, right? Mm -hmm. Who do you target with the mill? Mm -hmm. Because if you think that Jace is going to die, you definitely just target your opponent, uh, well, see, it's actually a little more complicated. If you think the Jace is going to live for a long time, you can just jam targeting yourself because you're going to get to uh, end up in a spot where you win the game with the the Jace's uh, passive of you know mm-hmm. drawing a card with no no cards in your library. If you think Jace is going to die, then you can't just target yourself, but you also don't want to just target the opponent because of uh, collecting evidence. So if they're a deck that can utilize that, then you're really incentivized to spend 
maybe target yourself with the first two mills, but then start targeting them once it gets to the point where you, you, you're getting in danger of milling yourself too much. And overall, I would say that I wouldn't count, I wouldn't go turbo hard counting on Jace living because if Jace lives for five turns, you're just going to win because you have that many extra cards. What I would do is just be, put, don't put yourself in a position where if Jace dies, you get decked, but do try to balance milling your opponent and milling yourself so that you're not making it too easy on them either. Yeah, it's a very fine line to walk. What grade would you give Jace? I mean, Jace is really good. It just, it kind of depends, I guess, on how hmm, how easy is it to cast that's the main the main bottleneck i would say in general jace's jace's is, is like an a level card in terms of what it does but it's probably a b just because of how difficult it is to cast yeah. that that's kind of where i would land baleful mastery is next it's 3 and a black for an instant and it says exile target creature or planeswalker but you can pay 1 and a black rather than the 3 and a black to cast it um, but if you do, then an opponent draw your opponent draws a card. I mean, this is a great card. Yeah, four it's mana, a good spell. Four, four mana exile creature is good, and and in a pinch, spending two is fine too. If you have to, you have to, you know. And it's, it's good to have that option. So I would give it a B. I don't think yeah. it's like anything special. This next one's kind of cool. Uh, Enlisted Worm. This is four green white for a five five worm with Cascade. So when you play this spell. Remove cards from the top of your library from the game, exile them. Th these are all the old versions of the cards that I'm looking at, by the way. Um, uh, until you hit a non-land card that costs less than Enlisted Worm, and then you can cast it without paying its mana cost. Oh, this is a sweet six drop, right? I mean, yeah, Enlisted Worm is really nice. It's it's six mana, five, five. And then if you, you know, depending on what you hit, you could get up to 11 mana worth of spells. You're getting a two for one unless you, unless you hit something that's not good to cast, which mm -hmm. can definitely happen. Yeah. Combat tricks and stuff, uh, you know, and, and cascade it just, if you don't cast it, you just, it's gone forever. Uh, still, I mean, enlisted worms, a perfectly sweet ramp target, six drop, whatever, uh, you know, it's in the, B ish range. I mean, it's a very good card to cast when you yeah, get. Yeah, I'll give it a B plus. Like, it's also yeah. pretty splashable. So, like, if you're playing green you, and you see this, you could probably pick it off and pick it up and play it off a nervous gardener or what, or what have you. Totally, a green red deck would run this all day. Uh, next is mystery key. This is one and a blue for an equipment. It costs one to equip, and it doesn't do anything to the creature. But it says whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, you can sacrifice the key and draw three cards. I'm not interested in this. No, this, this I think is pretty close to an F. Like you just, it's at best three mana draw three, but it takes, it takes quite a bit of work to, to have that happen. And when it misses, it does nothing. Yeah. That's just, I, I don't want that card in my deck. Bad. Uh, next is Ixidor Reality Sculptor. This is three blue, blue for a three, four, um, legendary creature. It says face down creatures get plus one, plus one. All right. Well, that's relevant here. And you can pay two and a blue to uh, turn target face down creature face up. That's actually great. Yeah. Though note that uh, it pumps their face down creatures too. Oh no. Does it really? Yeah. I was so, jokingly thinking, oh, hey, I can flip up my opponent's creatures, which is true, but. Like, so this is I, I would downgrade the great to actually really terrible because yeah that's horrible it, it's just an old templated card so I think it's like Ixor is an F just pumping their creatures yeah. is just not acceptable that's a deal breaker yeah for sure I didn't even see that uh, next is Bishop of the Bloodstained this is three black black for a three three vampire cleric when it enters the battlefield target opponent loses one life for each vampire you control what. There just aren't very many vampires in, in this format, so no, uh, just not something that I would, I would recommend playing. <laughs> we, we need to have a grade for the extra set of ignore. <laughs> uh, next is Koldatha Rebirth. This is red for a sorcery. It's, it's an additional cost to cast it. You sacrifice an artifact, and it gives you three 1-1 one, one red goblin creature tokens. This is pretty cute with uh, with like clues and stuff and yeah. like the red-blue deck, but yeah. I, I don't really think it works very well. I don't either. Like, I, I just think that it, it, it's not it's not going to be something that is 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 realistically going to come up. So, I would probably give this an F because this is a, another card where it's like if it works, it's okay, and mm -hmm. and it just won't work too often. 
No, the time when this is really good is turn one, when you can go like zero drop mountain, sack yeah. to zero drop, but that doesn't happen in this format. Next is Molten Psyche. This is one red red for a sorcery. Each player shuffles the cards from his or her hand into his or her library, then draws that many cards, and it has metal craft. You control three or more artifacts. It deals damage to each opponent equal to the number of cards that player is drawn this turn. This is enough. It just yeah. don't, don't even don't even bother. Are, Same with mass hysteria. It's a one red man enchantment. All creatures have haste. What the heck? Um, uh, Sir Conrad the Grim is good though. This not going to want to ignore this one. Three black black for a five four human knight at uncommon. It's a legend. Whenever another creature dies or a creature is put into a graveyard from anywhere other than the battlefield, or a creature leaves your graveyard, Sir Conrad the Grim deals one damage to each opponent. So. When it's kind of weird. If you played with this in Eldrin, you'll remember it. But whenever any creature dies, they take one. Whenever a creature is put into a graveyard from anywhere else, other than the battlefield, they take one. Or when a creature leaves your graveyard specifically, mm-hmm. they take one. Mm-hmm. Which that's a lot of ones. It adds up. It does it add up. up. And Sir Conrad also has one in a black. Each player mills one. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of start, you know, it, it juice juicing the scales if they if nothing's happening. You get to start, yeah, start making making things go. And he's a five four for five, which is pretty decent stats. Yeah, no, Sir Conrad is very dangerous, and when Sir Conrad's in play, uh, you know, I I always felt that I was losing if my opponent had one of these in play, and I and I didn't answer it because you you are every time like basically every time magic interactions happen, you take damage. And if if things slow down, they start spending mana, you start taking more damage. So I would give Sir Conrad a B. Just yeah. a, a really strong five mana play that threatens to end the game quickly. Um, next is Putrid Warrior. It's white black for a two two. And it says, whenever it deals damage, choose one. Each player loses one life or each player gains one life. No. Uh, next is Ranger Captain of Eos. This is the one white white three three. And when it enters the battlefield, you can search your library for a creature card with converted mana cost one or less, reveal it, and put it in your hand. And it has activated ability. You can sacrifice it, and your opponents can't cast non-creature spells this turn. I mean, the, the, if, you, if, you have, if you have a one drop to get, go get a novice inspector. You're, you're in really good shape. Yeah, that's a good card. I, and then, mm-hmm. so that's like the main bottleneck is like, do you have something to get? Mm-hmm. I like it. You also... We'll sometimes sacrifice it, but that's obviously not something that's going to come up super often. No, that's a very, that's a rare thing to have happen, uh, especially in limited. It's even rare and constructed, um, but it's a good card. Yeah, it's, it's a good card. I would give it a B, but that's also slightly predicated on having yes. something to go get with it. Uh, you, it's, technically, it's a build around B. Yeah. Next is Goblin War Chief. This is one red red for a 2-2. Two, two. Goblin Warrior, it makes your goblin spells one less to cast, and goblins you control have haste. I, no. It's enough. Yeah. There's just, it's just no there's support no for this. Yeah, there's like one rare goblin or whatever. Uh, next is Magma, which is three red red for a 4-4 four, four elemental, and you can pay one mana and sacrifice a non-land permanent to have it deal one damage to any target. So you can throw your clues or your tokens mm-hmm. or your bad creatures. I mean, this card is pretty threatening when it's in play and yeah. it's a five, five mana four, four is not the end of the world. So yeah. I, I think Magma is solid. I would give Magma a B minus probably. Yeah. It's like a C plus or a B minus next is world spine worm. This one costs 11 mana. It's a 15, 15 trample. When it dies, it becomes three, five, five tramplers and you can't have it in your yard. There's no abuse for this here, right? No, so no just there's enough. nothing going on. Uh, next is Stromkirk Captain. This is one red black for a two two first strike vampire that gives your other vampires plus one plus one in first strike. But there's not enough vampires to make this a payoff, right? No, I don't think there's there are enough vampires to really justify this either. Next card's okay. It's consign to oblivion. It's one it's one in a blue for consign, which is an instant that says return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. And then it has aftermath, which is um, basically like flashback. You can cast it from your yard. It's four and a black for a sorcery and target opponent discards two cards. I like that card. So, yeah. If you were exactly blue black, I would play this, put this card in your deck. It's yes. like a, it's like a B level card at that point, mm-hmm. but it's not good if you're not ex- again, exactly blue black. That's right. Uh, Nick's Weaver. This is a good one for this set. I think it's one green black for a two, three nice with reach. It's a spider. It's also an enchantment randomly. It's an enchantment creature. 
Um, it says at the beginning of your upkeep, put mill yourself for two, and then you can pay one black, green, and exile this Nyx Weaver to return any card from your graveyard to your hand. Yeah, Nyx Weaver is cool. Yeah. Uh, it helps you with collecting evidence. You can uh, use it when you use it. It can help with the like remove uh, a, a card when a card leaves your graveyard card. It It's three mana, two, three reach. Like it, yeah. it's just good overall. It is good. And and that card selection late game gets very legitimate. You get back your best bomb or card draw spell, removal spell. I mean, I think I'd probably give it a B. Like, yeah, I would give Nick really a B solid. as well. Uh, Ghost Quarter. It's a land that taps for colorless, or you can sack it to destroy a land, and his controller uh, may search his or her library for a basic land card, put it onto the put it put it into play. Man, these old templates are really getting me. Uh, and then shuffle. Yeah, I don't really think don't there's see a it, reason. Don't see a reason. It, it doesn't even get your. It doesn't even bump your uh, what's it called right? Your evidence collecting ability. No. Uh, next is high alert. This is one blue white for an enchantment. Each creature you control assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power. And creatures you control can attack as though they didn't have defender. And then you can also pay two blue white to untap a creature. I like having this type of card around. Look, this isn't a bomb or anything, but like this is something cool that you could open and try to build towards. Yeah, it's a it's a cool card. Yeah. It, it's I, not amazing I don't though. I think it's particularly good, but no. I think it is it is a neat card. It is. Oh man, not of the bone. Two and a green, you gain two life for each card in your graveyard, creature card in your graveyard, and you can flash it back for another two to the green. But I just, I don't see it doing anything here. Yeah, there's not enough of a self mill deck, even though, like, I guess green black with if you got like a Nick Weaver, which is also like a list card, right? You know, you could kind of like go that direction. There's some amount of that kind of thing, but no, I, I think in general, I wouldn't. I would say not of the bone is, is closer to an F than anything else. All these are making me want to do is play other formats. They really got to be careful with these. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next is laid to rest, which is three and a green for an enchantment. Whenever a human you control dies, draw a card. I, Whatever, there's no human sub theme here, so that's not going to be a thing. Uh, Quintorius Field Historian's interesting. This is three red white for a two four. Uh, it gives spirits you control plus one plus zero, and whenever one or more cards leave your graveyard, so there's evidence collection, create a three two red and white spirit creature token. I mean, it that's kind of interesting. It's a little weird to have it be in two colors that really aren't associated aren't, with yeah, it at all. It's that. like the blue green black kind of thing. So I guess that kind of makes it bad. Yeah, I don't think you're really gonna you're really gonna have Quintorius work. So it looks like a kind of build around like you know B to me that isn't really functional due to the colors. Though I guess if you were splashing, you could you could maybe do something yeah. like that. I mean, you have to be the build around case is five color collect evidence deck. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next is Metal Spinner's Puzzle Knot. It's two mana for an artifact, and when it ETBs. You draw a card and lose a life, and you can pay two in a black and sacrifice it to draw another card and lose another life. Because yeah, we don't have enough a, clues around? Or? Yeah, it's, it's weird to have. I thought it was a little weird to have this as yeah, well. Like, I would not be playing this. Um, no. Next is Hard Evidence. Blue. Love sorcery. It. Yeah, make an 03 crab creature token, and you investigate. Fits right in. Yeah. Craven Inspector. Yeah. Uh, next is Miss Vale Plains, which is a Plains adapts for white. It does ETB tapped, however, and you can pay one, you can pay a white and tap it to put a card from your graveyard on the bottom of your library. You can only activate this amazing ability if you control two or more white permanents. I don't think you're really ever gonna gonna no. actually no. build a deck where you need this to not get decked. It, no. it, it's possible, but I don't think it's gonna happen. This, Especially not in it's, white. It's really low cost. So if you, if you, if your deck is doing that, I guess you could just put it in. It's not gonna cost you a whole lot. But dude, it, a tapped it, land. That's not a huge cost. Oh man, I'm never paying that for this payoff though. It's a huge cost relative to what you get. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, next is shard of broken glass. This is white. For an equipment, sorry, one, it's colorless. one for an equipment. Thank you. Um, and it costs one to equip as well. And it says, whenever a equip creature attacks, you may put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. You know, you said it earlier, but collecting evidence has felt, especially the first collection, really like right where you want it to be. It's not that hard to get, but it's not free. You do not need to do things like this to enable that. No, you really don't. Uh, Crows and Tusker, this is... Hey, I'm going to read it in the order that it actually gets played. So it's cycling for two, two and a, uh, two and a green. And it says, when you cycle it, 
You may search your library for a basic land card, reveal that card, and put it into your hand and then shuffle. But it's got the backup plan of being a seven mana 6-5, six, five, five uh, GG for a 6-5. Yeah, I mean, it's a three mana draw two. It is. You, you you cycle it and then you you end up uh, you get a land get, and a card. getting a land and a spell and then the backup plan of casting it is is pretty reasonable as well. It's a good card. Um, yeah. Definitely would put would, it in all my green decks. I would give it like a C plus though. I just I don't think you're, you 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 can like lock yourself in to spending this much mana and, and expecting like gr- great things out from that. Right. Uh, next is Dusk Mantle House of Shadow. It's a land that taps for one mana. Or you can pay blue, black, tap it, and have somebody mill for two. Yeah, I don't think this I one is... I love uh, cards like this, but they're not good. No, I don't think this one's good. Uh, Treacherous Train is eight mana. It is six red, green for a sorcery, and it deals damage to each opponent equal to the number of lands that player controls. But here's the thing. It's a basic land cycler. You can pay two mana to cycle for a basic... I really like this card. I think I this card's too. awesome. I do too. You, you basically, it's a two mana basic land cycler, so it fixes your your colors. And at some point, you just cast it, and they die. They take like six to eight damage, maybe more. Yeah, you know, it's pretty hard for it to be too much less than that. Yeah, but you've always got it as a plan to be a basic land cycler, and you take it from there. Yeah, I mean, but this is the kind of thing I like out of my land cyclers, where you use massive upside when you when you want to cast it. Mm-hmm. So would you give it like a C? I'll give it a C. Yeah. I think you're just happy to put this card in your deck. Like I, I don't, I don't, I don't think this card is a, is a bad one at all. I mean, you, you obviously need to be able to actually cast it. I wouldn't play this in a blue black deck as just a land cycle. I don't think mm-hmm. though. It also puts eight points of evidence into the graveyard. It does. It really does. It, so that I don't covers know, maybe all it's just them. not bad. Yeah. Next is Monologue Tax. This is two and a white for an enchantment. It says whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn, <laughs> you create a treasure. Uh, I am not going to play Monologue Tax in my deck. No, no, no. You they, should, they can you just keep not. talking. Uh, next is Combine Chrysalis. I've seen this one on the battlefield a bunch. It's blue-green for an artifact. And it says creature tokens you control have flying. But here's the main thing. You can pay two blue-green, tap it, and sacrifice a token to create a 4-4 four, four green beast creature token at sorcery speed. You can turn your clues into 4-4s four with flying. Yeah, and, and all your tokens have flying. Like, yeah. I think com- Combine Chrysalis is a very good card if you can, if you have the support. So I think so, too. It's a build-around B, where if you, if you have the clue support, it can be really good. Next is Mentor of the Meek. This is the 2 and a white, 2-2. Two, two. And whenever another creature with power 2 or less enters a battlefield under your control, you can pay 1 mana. And if you do, you draw a card. I mean, there's a whole power two or less sub theme, you know, in this set and mentor of the meek would slot into that beautifully. Yeah. Mentor of the meek, uh, I think is just a solid card. Like if you, if you've got a reasonable, just a reasonable spread of, of creatures in a white deck, I would always play mentor. So I I think it's a B. I like B as well. Um, millstone two mana for an artifact. (laughs) You can pay two mana and tap it to have somebody mill to you or them. Would I be crazy yeah. to take this and just build around it? Yeah, I think so. It's pretty terrible, right? Yeah, I don't think it's very good. It just is like too slow to actually kill them. You, I don't think you want to use it in yourself to stock your graveyard. Like it just, the, nope. the games aren't, this isn't, you know, this isn't, you know, 20 years ago. The games just don't go that way anymore. Yeah. Uh, and then our last one, it is our last one, right? Yeah, is mm-hmm. Cavalier of Thorns, which is two GGG, so five mana for a five, six reach. And when it enters the battlefield, you reveal the top five cards of your library. You put a land card from among them onto the battlefield and the rest into your graveyard. And then when it dies, you can exile it. If you do, you put a, another target card from your graveyard on top of your library. The, the, again, the the the, the main card. issue here is it costs a lot of green mana to play this card. Yeah. So, but if you have if it, you, you're in, right? Yeah. I mean, you get a five six reach. You 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 stock your graveyard. You 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 get a you get a land, and then when it dies, you get the best card in your graveyard on top of your deck. Like that. That's a completely solid card. Totally. A five six reach is really nice stats on if you, especially if you can get it down on turn five, where like it's going to be the biggest thing by a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I put it in the A range if you can cast the dang thing. Maybe it's a B plus or an A minus or whatever, but 
All right, that's it. That's everything. That's the list. That's the uh, rares, and that's the mythic rares. Um, extraordinarily bomby set so far, Luis. Oh yeah, there's uh, a lot of really ridiculous rares and mythics that pretty much just take over games or end games, and uh, that is something you got to be a- aware of. I want to um, when we have uh, Sirkovitz on, we'll have to ask him if you know by that time when we've got more data if this set has a, a higher number of, you know, high win percentage cards at the top than a normal one. I'm curious if it actually pans out that way. That is going to do it for this episode of the show. If you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find um, everything related to the podcast over at lrcast.com, including links to all of our stuff like Luis's YouTube channel and the subreddit and all that kind of stuff. Um, we want to thank, uh, our supporters over at Patreon for supporting us. Thank you so much for that. As well as our sponsor, ultimate guard, make sure you check them out for all of your magic, um, protection organization, etc. needs. They are the best in the business. That's going to do it for this episode. We'll see you next time. Uh, I just wanted to touch a little bit more on the, the Leyline Rhinos deck I played in the RC yesterday. Cause it, it was a really good deck and, uh, there aren't that many times in my magic career, which is at this point a pretty long one, where I felt like I have a noticeably better deck than the rest of the field. And mm. this wasn't like near the top of those times. Like I think the the best decks I've had would be like the colorless Eldrazi deck where we had three people in the top eight and there was like six Eldrazi decks total in the top eight. Um, yeah. The Stoneforge Mystic deck that uh, Ben Stark won PT Paris with where we, we just, you know, kind of, it was just a, a deck out of nowhere, no one had it, and we were the only team that had it. Or the Elves deck that I won the Pro Tour with. Those are like that really stand out. But I got to say this: this Leyline deck, this Leyline uh, Scion Rhinos deck, did feel like that uh, kind of element. Where when I played against people who weren't prepared for the deck, or it, it felt like it was just a complete steamroll. Like playing the Rhinos Mirror, where you had these cards and they didn't. Like did not feel very competitive, and the the deck had like a ten percent higher win rate than Team of Rhinos, which is a huge jump given that it was only twelve cards different. Or wow, something. that's a lot of percentage in that format too. You don't get jumps like that. No, not at all. So uh, definitely a great a great deck, and uh, if you're looking to play modern soon, you got to respect it. Play cards like Edicts to make them sacrifice Draco. Uh, Hibernation is an interesting piece of technology. It's two and a blue instant return all green permanents to their owner's hands. So it bounces the Draco and the Ley Line uh-huh. <laughs> and, and, and all the Rhino tokens. So wow, it, it, it's a pretty nice little little uh, way to get around that. So I, I'm sure the deck will get worse once that happens. And I'm also a little disappointed because you don't get that many shots at having a better deck than everyone else. And, you know, in this day and age, everyone's so good at f- figuring out what's good and online play just drills to the heart of the matter so quickly that there aren't very many, many tournaments where this happens. So it would have been nice to convert with it. But, you know, it was nice to nice that I felt good about switching into the deck and uh, recommend either playing the deck or being prepared for it moving forward. 